What's up, Stalemates? Welcome to another episode. Very different guest today. We got a very different background too. Normally you see me in my basement, like, a, like Wayne's World style, but today we got the full production. Uh, we got Tyler and John in the house. Say what's up, but most importantly, don't forget Tara, Tara chief fan Tara, too. my favorite chief fan. Yeah, no, we got, <laughs> yeah. And then we also have the superstar of the show, Joey the Needle. What's going on, Joey? Uh, I'm doing all right, I guess. Yeah, Joey. Uh, so Joey wrote the book here. Um, I read this book. I it's funny. So we're both from Centerville, which is where we're at right now here in Southern Iowa. And um, whenever I was talking about doing this whole show, I was like, we need to. I think I was joking around with these guys. I was like, I was like, I think I'm gonna try to get the needle on the show because I remember reading your article back, and I was what 2013. 2013. Yeah, and um, I remember like just being like, how did I not know about this? Because it's yeah, it's Center Iowa. How did you not know about this? Yeah, and um, I remember just it was in study hall. They had the newspaper out, and I remember just being like, you know, reading it and just being super fascinated. It always stuck in my mind. And then whenever we started doing this whole podcast thing, I remember joking with these guys like, I think I'm gonna try to get the needle on the show. <laughs> I think John was like, heck yeah, do it. Yeah, I was like, you need to get somebody like really interesting and out there. <laughs> get them, yeah, really out entertaining. there. You got that right. He's like Joey Daniel. I was like, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and so we ended up, um, you know, I added you on Facebook, and I reached out and I said, I said, um, hey man, I have this podcast. I'm from Centerville. We have such and such subscribers. Um, would you be interested in coming on? I bought the book, and I'm gonna read the book. And your response was, why don't you go ahead and read the book, and then let me know if you still want me to be on your show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do you uh, do you think people? Do you think it was gonna be like a people would think it was not a good thing to have you on or? Yeah, I mean, what, uh, my thing is that people might look at this and say you're glorifying criminal activity. Yeah. That's my thing. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm not going to, I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to, it's not like it's glorifying it. I just want to get, like, your story out. I read the book in two days, yeah. and, uh, and I can barely even read. And <laughs> uh, I just freaking flew through it, and I was like, I, wanna, I want you to come on here and, and tell your story. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, no problem, man. Whatever. Whatever helps you out, buddy. Yeah, hopefully we can sell a couple copies. We'll put yeah. a link down in the description below for you guys to <laughs> for you guys to buy. It's it. self-published, to be honest with you. Why? Why I had the article in the Des Moines Register. I was fishing for a literary agent years ago, and I was hoping maybe th this the article in Des Moines Register was actually picked up by major newspapers. Mm. And uh, I was hoping to you know catch a literary agent, maybe get it published by a major publisher. Because my pitch on the book was. It's every bit as good as an orange is the new black or the Wolf of Wall Street. That's yeah. my pitch on the book. Yeah. You know, and uh, the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, he screwed a lot of people out of a lot of money. He, he, right. he, he should still be in prison like Bertie Madoff, really. And the uh, orange is the new black, was a, the series was good, but the book, what I got of it, she was some whiny chick who went to jail for a year and thought she was some kind of crusader when she got there. That's the bank I got of the book. Did you, did you they, read? They made a lot more money, but had a hell of a lot better time. Did you read both those books? I, I saw the Wolf of Wall Street. I didn't, I'm not a, he was a con artist. I, I dealt with enough con artists. I didn't want to read it too. I saw the movie, but I, I did read Orange is the New Black. Yeah. I feel like you were ahead of your time with, with the uh, books and stuff. Like, I don't know if that, if it's like a new genre or whatever for uh, like, you know, criminal books or whatever, but now like you look at Netflix, like the biggest documentaries are like the ones about crime. The Irishman. Yeah. The yeah. Irishman too. Irishman. Like all that yeah. stuff. Or, yeah. yeah. What was the name of that show? The Irishman one. The Irishman yeah. with um, who's that. the guy? Yeah, the Irishman. <coughs> the, uh, oh, uh, he was the mob guy. What's the the director guy? Martin Scorsese. Martin yeah, Scorsese. Yeah, 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 like yeah. Casino and that. Yeah. Who do you think would play you in a movie if you if you had a? Man, I don't know. Pesci. People say when I was younger, look, I look like Sylvester Sloan, but he's too okay. old now. Yeah, I see that. I yeah. don't know. Maybe. I, I don't, don't get that at all. You see these pipes right here, which camera <laughs> I'm looking at right here. Um, but let's talk about what actually, like people who they don't even know your story yet. Um, so back in what the late '80s, early '90s, you started selling steroids. Yeah, but, uh, before 1990, they weren't a controlled substance. They're pretty easy to get. Uh, but after the 1988 Seoul Olympics, Ben Johnson beat Carl Lewis in a foot race, and uh, the government threw a fit over it and made him controlled substance. So, okay, good stuff was hard to get. I knew there'd be a market there, and I knew how to get good stuff. 
Yeah, so you in the book you talk about like your early athletic days, which you have an insane memory because some of these some of these events that you're talking about, you remembered that, that what it was like that day. But you got to think, I wrote this book when I was in Marion, Illinois, at a federal penitentiary. Yeah. All you have to do, you, there's nothing else to do in there. So you, so I would zone out. Yeah. And, and remember all this stuff. I mean, you're gonna ask me stuff today I probably forgot about. You know? Yeah. But I, I, it would just I would zone out or I'd get up in the middle of the night and write stuff down and remember. It was like. I don't have that good a memory, but if you don't have anything else to do but time, I mean, right. you remember stuff, like, you know, right. reflect back on a lot of stuff. But you would, talk, you would talk about these events and it, like, it was like, I have a good I can't memory. even remember like <clears throat> hardly anything. And I was graduated like five years ago, but I can't even remember like my records and stuff, but you remember your split times oh, and yeah. everything. Oh, I'm, I know my split times. <laughs> yeah. I'm a, I used to be a pretty fast runner my day. Yeah. I, I remember my track times. I do. So you ran at William Penn. Uh, you played baseball at uh, Indian Hills for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And then all that kind of was like not working out. You were kind of getting burned out, and you had you know problems with the coaches and whatnot. And so you started working out. Yeah. And you, one day someone offered you steroids. I I I, I fished for them. You could get them back back in the, back in the mid '80s. You could you could get them pretty easy. Yeah. Like I say, it, they weren't hard to come by. Like they were a controlled sub. Well, what's that conversation sound like? You just go to a guy and be like, hey, man, I know, uh, you're, I, I know you're juicing. You know people. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, you, you know how to get stuff. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so you started. I got to think that's that's the 80s conversation I don't remember. Yeah. I have a pretty good memory about the 80s, but I don't remember, hey, who to approach and stuff. What year did you first dabble? I think it was 80, what, 85. 85? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I took a couple of cycles of Dianabol. How, uh, is, that, is that the most popular one? Depends. I, I mean, feel like that's the one I hear whenever like UFC people get busted is like Dianabol or... Uh, a lot of people get busted. What's the other one? Test. That John Jones got busted for like Turinabol or something like that? Yeah. I'll tell you, mm-hmm. People mm-hmm. get busted. People forget busted for like Nandrolone and Equipoise and stuff like They don't know what they're doing because that shit stays in your system forever. I don't know what they're doing. Right. Because some of that stuff like stays in your system for a year and a half. Right. I mean, some of it, uh, old school tests would have been easy to beat. I don't know about today because I'm out of it, but old school tests would have been easy to beat because old school tests, if you took pills and it was out of your system in six weeks, hmm. you could take water-based testosterone and it was out of your system in a day or two. Hmm. But I don't know how, like I say, I'm out of it. I don't know what the testing is today. I don't know. It's probably more complex. Okay. The old school testing, they would have been hard to beat at all hmm. if you knew what you are doing. Hmm. So... You started down a little bit. How long until you actually started saying, "Okay, I want to go from the consumer side to the user or to the seller side"? When uh, when they made a controlled substance, I was still wanting to dabble in it, but there was a lot of fake shit on the market. Mm. I mean, a lot of stuff that garbage. So I knew how to get good stuff, and people word of mouth, and then I started selling. So you, before you would get into the Ukrainian stuff, because it yeah. gets a whole lot crazier. Before that, your first like attempt or whatever at it was going to vet clinics. Yeah, I, Winstraw V is Winstraw V is sold at vet clinics, and I knew uh, they carried it or they could get it for you. And I, I would borrow my dad's greyhounds and uh, pretend I was a dog man, and it was I could get basically when I want what I wanted. Because your dad raised greyhounds for like hunts. They're called field trial dogs. Okay, what's that? They mean? Uh, what they do is they'll. Uh, they're like a, a dog race through the woods. Mm. They like, they get like a, a coon drag, drag it through the woods. And they'll hang like a coon up in a tree and it's like a mile run. And or, you gamble on that or what? No, it's more for the, it's more for the sporting people. Oh, gotcha. They, yeah, like if you enter a dog and he, and he hits the line first, yeah, you win money. The, the dog owners do, mm. but like spectators don't bet on it. Okay. Doesn't that make sense? It's more like a sport. Yeah, it's for the yeah for the sports people, the dogs. That okay. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. So then you started. Um, you go, you were going to vet clinics, and you said you dressed up like a like a farmer. Yeah, I knew a ball hat, old clothes. What's that sales pitch like? You just go up and say, "Hey, I need." Would they yeah. just give it to you? More than likely, yeah. They didn't. It got it got where they just mail it to me. I just asked for a call for refill. And they That's just, crazy. They just mail it to me. And that that kind of steroids humans could take. Yeah, I mean, it's veterinary grade, but yeah. Yeah. yeah it, 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 they're more worried about animals than our people. It's not going to hurt. You know, Was right? it cheap? Mm, not really. Not really? Then you, not the wet straw. Wet straw is not cheap. Right. When you would go to sell it to people, would you tell them, like, hey, this is actually for horses, but you'll, oh, you'll be Oh, that's right, right on there. Yeah. I mean, I mean they, 
if you did research, I mean, it says right under for horses, cats, and dog. But Winstrol, I mean, yeah, Winstrol is a veterinary drug in America. Anybody who takes steroids, they, that's just the way it is. Winstrol is not made for human use in America. Is it just, is it just as good? Um, it makes you springy. It won't put much weight on you. It, track guys like it. Mm. Bodybuilders like it. Mm. If you want to get stronger, you take tests, Decadurabol and Dianabol, rule of thumb. That's, I don't even know what you just said. I just had <laughs> like more language. There, there's some juices out there know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, your original nickname was Joey the Doctor, but I like Dr. Joe. Dr. Joe. And, I, and sometimes Dr. Feelgood. That was kind of <laughs> I always think it's funny whenever you'd have like a fighter, uh, like, you know, underweight, you'd be like, they just call up Dr. Joe and I got you back on track. Yeah, like I said earlier, man, you wrestled at 106. I, like, I could have pumped you right up to I could have made you heavyweight. Man. I looked for your, I, yeah, I know. I looked for your ads in the yellow pages. I couldn't find you. I should have, uh, should have called around. Um, so then you, you, you did the whole vet clinic thing. That well kind of dried up, and then you started, uh, you somehow got a hold of a prescription pad. I got pad. prescription pads, and I was pretty good with the prescription pads. Yeah. I knew how to write. I got a hold of a physician. Can you talk about how you got the prescription pad? Uh, I better not. I better not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys got to remember that this wasn't that, that long ago. Yeah. yeah. 20. Uh, the statute of limitations probably wore out, but uh, it, I'm not going to tell. He, this he, first time I ever wore a wire anyway. It was yeah. kind of eerie. I didn't like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so you got a hold of a prescription got pad. Got a hold of a prescription pad. Oh, you need one. All you do, well, no, and you copy them off. You got, there's copy machines, you know. Right, yeah. yeah. So how did you know how to even, because in the book you actually um, show a picture of, like, when you would write a prescription, what that would look like. How did you know the, the numbers and the lingo and all that? Oh, uh, you look up in the, phys, you get a physician's death reference book. Mm -hmm. And plus, it, it, it's not rocket science. <laughs> yeah. It really not. I mean, I'm weirdly smart in some ways, and that's just one thing I was weirdly smart in. That makes sense. Yeah. Do you think you ever could have uh, maybe done the medical school route? I got two cousins they are fed lawyers, and we'll talk about the one that bailed me out of hell of a jam, but I kind of got some lawyer in me. You lawyer blood in me, but not doctor. I feel like uh, when we get into like some of the when we get into the part where we get into your trials and stuff like that, you, it felt like you kind of knew more than some of the lawyers because you were like, I knew this guy didn't know anything about fed law or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you know, you, so you got a hold of a prescription pad, you would write your own prescriptions, you would take them into just... I'd would, call ahead of the pharmacy first to make, the, make sure they had it. Yeah. Were, were they carrying that kind of stuff at that they, time? They, they would if you had said you had a prescription. And who... They would order it for you. Who was legally getting steroids? Like for what? Like people like me who can't put on weight or Well, what? um, in today's world they give it for testosterone replacement therapy. When you hear testosterone replacement therapy, that's what you're getting. Okay. That makes sense? But what, what... For low T, when you hear them first for low T... Mm -hmm. that's that's what they're giving you that's the same thing the same damn thing you just got to go to medical school to sell well it. you got to go to a doctor to get it a yeah. real doctor not dr <laughs> joey <laughs> not me so then you started um did you ever get turned down by people no nah, because i would uh call ahead yeah i call ahead and i kind of knew which t i knew which pharmacies to go to yeah and were you going to the same pharmacies or did you um try to switch it up um there was one one town I hit all the pharmacies, a pretty liberal town I knew, and plus you could write for refills and they'd have it ready for you and you call in six or three months later to have a refill ready for you. So they kind of they kind of knew, they already knew if, you and stuff, you're like a regular customer. Well, I mean, I, I didn't write my real name on it. But right. I mean, I had, what name I, did you use? I've used a lot of fake names. <laughs> <laughs> then you, any come off the top of your head? Jeff Phillips is one of them. Jeff Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so then you, you know, you did that whole route and then this is where we get into the crazy part. So yeah. I think a lot of people maybe, uh, from around here that knew your story, just thought you were selling steroids, like locally and stuff. Thought they knew my story. They thought they knew your story. <laughs> you started dealing with the Ukrainians, yeah. which if you know anything about steroids or anything, um, that's where the good stuff was. Eastern Europe. Yeah. So how did you get the tie from? Well, Europe period local Centerville, Iowa, Southern Iowa, just north of Missouri, Missouri border to Ukraine. There was a pro, there was a pro steroid magazine out in the 1990s called Muscle Media 2000. It's pretty much an open book. I mean, they, you, you would read the magazine. It told you about all the roids, everything in there. It was pro steroid. I mean, they were pushing roids. And, uh, one day I, uh, 
there's a guy that wrote a letter to the editor from the Ukraine saying he wanted to uh, start a body bodybuilding friendship between America and the Ukrainians. And I read between the lines, I wrote him a letter and said, send me, send me your list, pal. I know what's going on here. And he sent me a list. That's wild. So you, I feel like most people probably would have read that and I didn't know exactly how it was read, but. I wish I, I, wish I could have that art. I, I, I lost that magazine, but anybody, I read between the lines. It was, it, I read between the lines. We actually have the article here. No, I'm just kidding. I wish you did. <laughs> I wish you did. Yeah, we, well, we tried to find it. We were looking around <laughs> and stuff, but we couldn't find anything. It's hard to find some of this stuff. I know. I know it is. But I'm we, antique. It, this was like 1990. People don't think about like the that this was before the tech boom. Like people today would be like, oh, a connection to Russia that could be definitely accomplished. But like yeah. you're, you're responding to a magazine ad. Yeah. Like that's wild. Was yeah. there a was this a national publication magazine? Yeah. And so could you just buy this at like freaking what the off pharmacy or something? Yeah. Yeah, it was Muscle Media 2000. And so they were just advertising like. Oh hey. yeah, it was open market. Yeah. Yeah. Because this was like back in the 90s, nobody really cared. It right. was illegal, but nobody really cared. Right. Then the guy, he kind of got away from it. I don't know if he took some heat, but the guy named Bill Phillips ran the magazine, I think. Bill mm. Phillips. Okay. But anyway, he got away from it. But uh, yeah, there for a while, it was free for all. I'll just tell you, it, it, we mentioned there Greek pharmacies. That was a big place people were getting them. Greek pharmacies? Greek pharmacies. Why is, why is that? Because it's legal over there. You, can go in, you, used to be able, you can be able to go in a pharmacy and get steroids in Greek. Okay. See, when I first started selling this stuff, in today's world, it's all underground lab shit. Yeah. Back then, it was it was top of the line, line pharmaceutical grade. That's the big difference between what's going on today and, and, and now. Hmm. That makes sense. Because just... all the stuff I was getting from from Ukraine, you could get you could get out of a pharmacy in Poland. You could get out of pharmacy in Greece, Iran. I mean, it was top of the line. But the stuff now, how it's coming in, people know, people are getting in powder from China or India, and it's basically like a clandestine lab. And they, they're making it in their own basement. Hmm. Pharmaceutical grade stuff is not very popular on the market now. Hmm. So you read between the lines, and I think a majority of people that would go through that magazine would just see that ad and just go to the next page. What was it that made you say, "I think there's something else going on here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in touch with these guys." Well, um, I knew the East German women. Yeah. East Germany. They, they had the. They were. I knew everybody knew they were doping our athletes. That part of the world. Everybody knew that, excuse me, athletes were being doped. And I yeah. read between the lines and I mean, that was, that was a no brainer. I mean, that's just something I figured out in a hurry. What'd you say in the letter? Cause you wrote them a letter saying, I want, I want in on what you got going on. What'd you I say? Him, I said, I knew what he had, man. Send me a list. I know you guys got good stuff over there. And then he wrote back. He wrote back. What'd Send he me say? a list. He sent you the he list? Sent me a list with a price, price list. And what was that looking like? What was the price? Pretty, pretty, pretty good stuff. Pretty good price. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you, uh, you wrote him a letter and then in the book you talk about what I thought was interesting is like, you talked about, you know, you're like, oh, you're thinking, should I do it or not? And you weren't really necessarily worried about getting in trouble. It was more like, is this guy going to take my $400? No, I had pretty, I, 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 I thought I was getting my stuff because I, the old Soviet union, I knew that people, they needed money, right. you know, and if, and if they ripped me off 400 bucks, so be it. But they, I knew that, you know, that they want to run a business because they're, they're poor over there and they, they need a steady income. Mm -hmm. They're not going to, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. they, they don't just want the $400 rip one time paid. They're wanting to start a business. And I, I, I kind of got that with this guy. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, you, I you, knew he was, I, I, but well, the list and stuff, yeah, I knew he's a businessman. And did he tell you how many people actually responded to that ad? Once I got over there, he did, but uh, not, it was, the letter was pretty, what I did, I went and got a bank, I went and got a, uh, a banker's check, mailed it to him, told him what I wanted, and uh, it, it arrived. Hmm. So what was that, what was that day like? You, you know, you sent him the $400, you're like, because it's not like Amazon Prime now where you get that <laughs> stuff in two days, you probably had to wait like a week? Oh no, it was probably four to six weeks. Four to six weeks? Yeah. Dang. I People would lose their the, minds now. I actually <laughs> had a sign for the package too. Yeah, and so this, That's a, this guy shows up, you know, probably know what it was, right? What's that? You probably knew what he had, right? You probably, like, that was the only thing coming in the mail for you or no? No, I, I, it, he told me I was going to come, exactly. I was going to, it's going to come in a box, you're going to have to sign for it, and it's going to be these little wooden eggs, and you're going to have to take a, you got to have to take a saw and cut the eggs open and stuff will be in the eggs. And that's how they're getting it through customs. In the beginning. Okay. 
So you finally, the eggs finally arrive. You get, you go to like True Value and buy a saw, buy right? Buy a saw and cut it open. And cut it open. You said the first one took you like an hour? Yeah, because I didn't want to break. I, I ordered some vials, bottles. And I didn't want to break them. How much, I guess, how, like, how big of a supply was it in the beginning? $400. I probably made, well, I probably doubled my money. Mm -hmm. So I probably made 800 bucks off of that. Plus, it's people are kind of skeptical because the, 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 at first the pills didn't come in original packaging. Mm -hmm. He stuck the pills in an egg, and I had to tell him, hey, I'm, and once I got it out to people and they were using it, they said, yeah, this is good stuff. And the word started getting around town, like? Word started, I, if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't have dealt much in town. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I was going to weightlifting contests, you know, bench press meets, and that's, there's, a, there's an open market there. People always want stuff, you know. Did people believe you when you tell them, hey, I got this from the Ukraine? Yeah, because they knew I'm not, not a bullshitter. They know I'm a pretty straight shooter. So you only sold to people that kind of knew you then? It'd be, yeah, yeah, at the beginning. Yeah, in the beginning. And so, yeah, you're kind of killing it. This stuff sounds like hotcakes. You're building this relationship with the Ukrainians. They eventually say, hey, we want to uh, make you our guy. Well, here's what happened. He got nailed on his end because he was stuff. He was putting your, that stuff. Your partner in the Ukraine. Yeah, he got nailed on his end because uh, he, was, he was shipping these little wooden eggs. And he, it was a generic design on the eggs. And mm -hmm. over there, the, the postal people caught on to him first. And uh, in Ukraine, they don't care about steroids, but you can't be selling stuff without paying taxes. He bought his way out of it, basically. And he owed me some, uh, a supply of it. He owed me, yeah, he owed me some. Because one of my packages got intercepted by him, his people. And I wrote him a letter. He said, I, you know, I'm having problems. I said, well, just send me what you can. I'm not worried about my money back. And so that's when we developed a good relationship. And from there on, I didn't pay for anything up front. It was sent to me on the spot. Mm. So he you thought it was pretty cool that I, I wouldn't. He had a lot of crybabies wanting their fucking money back, you know, being little whiny bitches. I was like, hey, man, <laughs> shit happens. Yeah. You know, get it to me if you can. And he said, thanks. Anything you want from now on, it, it's coming to you and then you pay me later. And so he started trusting you a little bit. And yeah. he was like, I'm going to start sending you more than yeah. everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Then he starts selling and, and he started sending me his pretty and, and letters, yeah. envelopes. And that was, a, I was his guinea pig on that because the, Letters come open, and I got nailed in 1996. And that's kind of, that's the first time you got first in trouble. First time I got in trouble. So you got in trouble in 1996. You started sending them in uh, envelopes, and that would get kind of crushed. Got crushed, And yeah. the postal uh, yeah, service they, people. They, they come in on me. Yeah, so what was that first time you got popped for? I was riding around town, and he, he sent me, a, and I was expecting a bunch of packages. And he, uh, and I remember I was down by the YMCA rec center here. <clears throat> And I saw a couple of police cars and they stopped me and a guy, a couple of postal inspectors jumped out of their van. They had an arm full of packages. I'm like, oh, fuck. They man. were yours? They were mine. Yeah. <laughs> Coming you, to me. Because you had uh, P.O. boxes. I had a P.O. box here. In Center Hill, I just had one here for At that. At that time? At that time. And so they, you, they kind of, they got you and then they, they took you me. down to the station? Yeah. I, uh, I tried to play where uh, I needed a lawyer stuff and they wouldn't buy it. If I had to do it over again, I'd probably fight it because they refused to give me a lawyer. Yeah. And I would But they were like, ah, uh, you know, well, we're not going to do anything to you, blah, blah, blah. I told them it's Clem Buterall. They didn't know what the fuck Clem Buterall was. <laughs> I don't but know. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it took them three years to make a finally give an arrest on me. Three years? What were they doing? Why three years? I don't years? know. I, have, I, I, can't answer, I can't answer for them. No, yeah. I have no idea. And so they I thought they was going to forget about it. I and don't, you, I don't. you had told them that. Uh, at that point, you told him you had like a mail order bride or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I told him I was getting the shit. I wasn't gonna tell him, but I told him I was hooked up with a doctor room in Ukraine, and she was mailing me shit. Yeah, and then so you basically got like a you didn't do much time for that. Did I you? didn't do any time. I got like a parking ticket. To be honest with you. Yeah. Serious misdemeanor. Yeah, that's Carriers. crazy. Is that looking what back? Looking back, I was pretty. I was kind of worried about them, but looking back, I'm like compared to what was gonna go on in the future. Right. That was a, that was a parking ticket. Right. And so would you, would that happen today? What? What would you have gotten in trouble for? If that happened like today, what, what would that look like? Time or would it be a parking ticket again? If you got, my, for me? Well, like, yeah, if, well, not for, for me. You, if like, I, for your if, first time? Yeah. I was serious, state to state. Yeah. For, for uh, you, if you got caught with a bunch of stuff, parking ticket. Parking ticket. Well, not a bunch of stuff. Personal use stuff, parking ticket. So, but don't let them, t and they're gonna come in and tell you, you know, <laughs> that you're going away forever. 
blah, 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 parking ticket. I feel like I'm just going to have you be my lawyer. Parking ticket. Missouri, <laughs> the, like, the, Missouri you're caught, possession's a felony. Yeah. And Iowa, possession is a parking ticket. Serious, don't let them tell you, it's a serious misdemeanor, aggravated yeah. misdemeanor. All right, let me write that down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you up from that 106. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be fighting that 125 soon. <laughs> um, so you get in trouble for that. Every time you got in trouble, it didn't phase you pretty much till the uh, end. But you just would in the book. You said like as soon as you would get in trouble, you'd call the Ukrainians. And say, I took about a, I took about a uh, I took some time off after the first time I got caught. How how much time? About six months. That's nothing. That's a oh, vacation. Uh, yeah, that's sick. Because I did. then we uh, he he, he uh, developed into a better smuggler. So, uh, yeah. Through me. Can you talk about the other ways he would do it or no? Well, it got in 1998 when it got big. I mean, we was getting in on airplanes. I mean, we 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 come in from a nickel and dime operation to where it was. I mean, we were getting shit smuggled in on airplanes. We figured it out. So you 1996, you got arrested. They didn't actually bring you back in until 1999 when they yeah. started charging you. Were you selling in that three year time? Oh yeah, so that six months was. No, I didn't bother me. Oh, that's when I got. Yeah, nine, oh yeah. Yeah, and at that point, were you still trying to grow the business, or were you just? It was getting big. Yeah. You were, you were trying to keep it keep it going. Oh, it was going. Yeah, and so that's when they started bringing you. They're like, we can trust this guy. He got yeah. in trouble. He didn't say anything. Yeah, he well, didn't, they knew. He I, wasn't I, mad that our that well, I, 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 I wrote him letters and said, hey, man, you, you know, you sent me that letter crushed them pills up. I mean, you guys, it's on, it's on fucked you. up. You got you got to do something better than this, you know. And, and so he started really trusting you. He yeah. started sending you more stuff. And yeah. in the book, you talk about the first time he sent you a big package. Before, it was like little envelopes and stuff. Yeah. And one day you go and they sign, they say, hey, well, you got a big one. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. How big was uh, that shipment? Oh, I mean, I mean, I got lots of big shipments, man. Well, the first one, you said that it was oh, like I mean, such a big there, box you couldn't get in your trunk. I can't remember. There's probably at least 10,000 tabs of Russian dye animal in it. I mean. How much money on the street is that? For 10,000 tabs of Russian dye animal. At that time? I don't know, probably 50 grand, probably. 50 grand? Uh, probably. They would wow. send me that much. Oh, yeah, they'd send me that much. So would you sell it and then no, pay I the Ukrainians? No, I was a shipper. You what? I, was ma- I, I, I started developing a customer base through an underground magazine. Yeah. And I was doing pretty well, but I, I was doing a lot of reshipping for them. So they would send it to you and then you would send it. So you weren't actually selling again, like selling. You're kind of the middleman? No, I, I, I was selling and being, I was selling and shipping for them. Oh, wow. So I had to get a nice discount for helping them out. And you got your national client base through your own ad. Underground magazine, yeah. Was it the same one? Mm-mm. Newsletter. Newsletter. Did the people at the magazine, did they know what was going on? Yeah, it was an underground, it was an underground steroid magazine. So you, like, they were stuck in the 90s. He, right. Nobody really cared. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't that big a deal. Yeah. What, what did like an advertisement cost for you in that? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. That's but and it, it wasn't real blunt. What you'd write, you'd write you have aerogenic AIDS. That was the code word for steroids. Huh. That makes sense? Why was that? That's just a code. That's just a, when you say aerogenic aid, that's, that was, that was a What's aerogenic slang mean? for steroid. It was slang for steroid. Aerogenic aid. Do they still use that today? I, I've been out of it. I don't know. <laughs> See, today's a different world, too. You can buy some, like today, there's like peptides and SARMs. You can actually buy SARMs on the internet, huh. like Osterine. Okay. You, it's not illegal. It's black, it's very gray market, but like Osterine and stuff, some of that stuff is, I hear it's pretty good and it's, it's borderline legal. Is that SARMs? Is that the uh, hormone they take from like milk? See, I'm not, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't study it anymore. But there's like peptides and SARMs. The, them SARMs, like Osterine and shit, I've heard it's pretty good. I've heard, and they, they test you for it, and you get nailed for it, but I've heard it helps your, I've actually heard it lowers your cholesterol. I mean, I, I've kind of read about it a little bit, and it's kind of interesting to me, but I can say, and, and they, they're, if a guy's going to do it, he better get on it, because they're, they're going to make that illegal, and all this shit blows over, like the corona and shit, because right now it's got everybody occupied, but once this gets over, they're going to come in on stuff like that. There's, there's a few more SARMs. The, the one that stuck out was Osterine, because that's the one I was looking into. That, that was sense. yeah, and that's been around for a while. But like, it is something that's been, been blown. I've been seeing more stuff about that here recently. Yeah, and, and you can you, if it's an underground lab. If you're if you're if you're buying it for something like experimental use or lab use, you can buy it. Some some gray market thing or some. Right. 
it's borderline legal the way I get it. Well, There's a lot of stuff like that right now. Yeah, it's, 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 pep, it's just, I don't just know a matter the, of time. Yeah, and it's peptides. I don't know what they are. That's a whole. That's been a whole different thing. I'm old school. Testosterone, Deca. Oh, yeah. yeah, same here. Winstraw. <laughs> um, so you were, you know, you did the whole steroid thing. I know a lot of people are thinking, like, you know, what your personal life was like. You actually had a daughter, who yeah, was close to my age. So she would have been born around what ninety five, three, ninety three. Okay, so she, um, you had her. That kind of changed your life. And I thought what was interesting is you didn't really talk about the money that. You didn't care so much about the money, just what it, prov- it provided you free time? Yeah, provided me free time with my daughter. Yeah. Me and her mother split, and I still got to be, she let me stay involved with her in my daughter's life. You know, she, my daughter spent a lot of time down at her grandmother's, and I would always go down there and pick her up. I mean, I, first day of school, did all that stuff. You know, I, from, from child, you know, she was born to five, six years old. I mean, I was there basically every day, even though me and her mom were split. Yeah, that's awesome. I think a lot of people don't really, like, I don't know how drugs or um, I don't know how steroids is like for profit compared to like other drugs, but it just you it was just interesting to hear you talk about you know you didn't care about the Free money time, as much. Free time, you know. Plus, plus when you're in a business like that, there's always a chance that man you could hit it rich. Yeah. I mean, you know, you got back. It ain't like the internet today where you can get on and buy stuff. I mean, I had a monopoly on top of the line stuff right here in Southern Iowa. I mean, A one grade stuff. Yeah. Pharmaceutical grade stuff. You had a really good quote in the book, which I, maybe I can find it real quick. But um, if you don't, I mean, I don't want to crap on Centerville too much, but they, it's been labeled the meth capital of the world, which I feel like <laughs> it's kind of BS because I feel like it used a, to be. There, boy, a, it used to be in the 90s, boy. Yeah, but a lot of people say that about their small town. I feel like any small town in Iowa, they're like, <laughs> this is the meth capital of the world. So I don't know. But you have this quote where you said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and read it. My small hometown of Central Iowa was always considered the methamphetamine capital of the Midwest. I really don't know if that statement was true or not. I can promise you that in 1999, Centerville, Iowa was the anabolic steroid capital of Iowa and quite possibly the steroid capital of the USA. It might have been. Did you, uh, <laughs> did you ever talk to other dealers and stuff or no? I didn't know any other. I was a the dealer. There's no reason to me to talk to them. <laughs> I supplied dealers. There's no reason to me to talk to them. Yeah, that's crazy. Do you believe and that's thing, true? People want to know how much money I made. I know people are going to. I threw out the term $75,000 once. I don't know because I did a radio show. And to be honest with you, I just threw that term out. Yeah. But I'll, I'll put it like this. In 1995, I was flat broke. Probably had 1000 bucks in my name. When they busted me heavy in 1999, I had close to $30,000 saved, stashed. And you got in 99, it's flying all over the world, too. Mm-hmm. Plus, I uh, went over, the, we'll talk about later, I went to the Ukraine, threw $10,000 in my buddy's lap. And what, what I'm getting at, I, have, I had $30,000 stashed. You mm-hmm. know, I've worked for 10 years now, and I don't have $30,000 stashed, and I've got a pretty good job. So that's how I'm going to answer how much money you made. That makes sense? Yeah. <laughs> you just didn't keep track. <laughs> Did you ever splurge it, on anything? I like to travel. What was the dumbest thing you ever bought? I didn't buy dumb stuff. Nothing? I, I like to travel. You weren't like a car guy? No. A... I, I was pretty smart about that. I kept, didn't buy fancy cars. Yeah, it seemed like you were never trying to be very extravagant at any point. No, you just wanted I, to live I'm your daily not. life. No, I'm still not. I like to gamble. Boy, I like the horses. Did you ever so, hit a big with gambling? I've hit a big. What's I've the biggest you've ever done? I've lost two. <laughs> I, I hit a 75 to one shot at Prairie Meadows once. 75 what? 75 to one. Wow. Had 10 across the board on it, paid 1,082 bucks. But I've given that back plus more, man. Let's not lie about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not one of these guys that's going to tell you I'm good at it. If I was good at it, I wouldn't go to work tomorrow That's morning. gone. John will That's pretend. me. I'm really yeah. good at sports betting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all are. Well, I've, you know, I've only lost money, so. <laughs> we all are. I'll uh, tell you about all my wins, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't. Yeah, I, uh, I, the thing about it is Prairie Meadows. I got a player's card. You get me free rooms. Free food. Discount on my hookers. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it all evens out. The way I look at it, I go to Prairie Meadows, bet horses. I get free hotel rooms. I can stay there and get smashed. And don't have to worry about driving home. That saves me $11,000. <laughs> the glass is always half full. Here's, my word. Every gambler has, like, uh, something to, like, um, reason why they gamble. And for, like, me, it's, like, I could take my fiance out to the dinner and movies. That's going to cost me like 50 to 70 bucks. Or we could stay home and I could gamble on the Lakers for 50 to 75 bucks. And I could possibly make, I could possibly make the money back. 
There's it's entertainment. There's zero hooks. It's, it's entertainment. That's why I, I mean I mark it off as entertainment. It's entertainment. Yeah. You can't that's gamble more, I, if you're if you can't gamble more than you're willing to lose. The thing about it is, I'm gonna be honest. Being in this game I was in, it's kind of it's a, it's almost addictive gambling. Yeah. You're always looking over your shoulder, and that's where I get my fix now. I go bet on the horses. Did you? So you were competitive your whole life. You still said earlier you, you still compete in like. Yeah, uh, I try to. What, what's the class called? Oh, is it old timers. The old timers. The old uh, claiming horses. You're still doing 50, 50 uh, <laughs> meter, meter dashes. Days, yeah. And the old timers uh, races, and so were you kind of getting that competitiveness like because you said you know i was we were the steroid cap of the world in centerville um were you getting that competitive like did you want to be competitive did you want to you want to make money well did you want to be the best though yeah i want to make money i mean i'm not gonna lie but i wasn't consumed with it like free time's hard to beat man i mean you We'll start, you know, we'll get in where I was traveling with Bobby Hoffman. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't put a price tag on that shit. So let's, let's get into that since we're here. You, this, the whole book, you have like two separate stories. Yeah. There's a, there's a plot and a subplot. So there's the main plot. That's why, that's why I'm on your show. That's why I'm on this kid's show. The, uh, the MMA part of it. Yeah. So here we do wrestling. We do a little bit of MMA. I think Uh, you should get in a cage. (laughs) (laughs) Me? Yeah. (laughs) You got, you got Mike England to help you out. You got yeah. Johnny Wolfpack over here. Get trained, <laughs> you know what I mean? Shout out to your little girlfriend could be the ring card girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nah. You'd be good at it. How long do you think I'll last? How many rounds? Oh, hell, I don't know. Yeah. Don't underestimate yeah, go yourself. Go what ahead, do you weigh? I'll go ahead and show you these. What do you weigh? Me? I've been stressed. You got lately. that wrestling background. Not the size of the dog in the box. <laughs> yeah, you got that wrestling background. Yeah, what is it? More than I got. Dynamite comes in small packages. Yeah, there you go. We get you in there. Yeah, I weigh one thirty-five right now. How, if I started, if I hooked up with Doctor Joey, what would I get up to? <laughs> Doctor Joe's out of business. <laughs> the old Doctor Joe. Old Doctor Joe. You want you want to keep your weight down? We'd make you stronger. You okay. Want, fight at a lighter weight. One thirty-five be a good weight. You'd be bantam weight, whatever. That <laughs> yeah. We get you stronger. The ninety-nine, the nineteen ninety-nine Joe would get you stronger. Okay. Well, Got that reach at one thirty-five. All right, we'll, we'll be in touch. If you guys start seeing me looking swole after the show, it's yeah, he's getting it for somebody else, not me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, really big, really quick. Yeah. <laughs> actually, we brought the Centerville PD in. Can they come out? <laughs> you guys uh, again, huh? Yeah. Um, so, the subplot. Yeah. Bobby Hoffman. Bobby Hoffman. A lot of people, he gets skimmed over a lot, but the UFC today is not what it was back in the day. Like, it's on ESPN now. That's yeah. owned by Disney. Yeah. The UFC back then was a lot more underground. They just had UFC 252. Bobby... Hoffman was a heavyweight from Centerville. He was on UFC 2, like the second card ever, right? No, nah, he, he didn't make it till uh, I was in the pen. He didn't make it till uh, the year 2001. Still no, early. No, t- 2000. He fought Maurice Smith. I mean, the UFC was a thing in like, what, 99 or 98? Yeah, he, uh, he didn't start. He, he got into it in 98. And he, so he was going around. He was going, and it wasn't even called MMA. Then. It was called No Holds Barred. It was called No Holds Barred. Bare knuckle brawl. I mean, submission boxing. Right. MMA was a term. When uh, and here's how this worked. Me and Bobby, we we were on the same football team. But he's two years younger than me. Our family, our our fathers were friends growing up. Mm. We had an uncle get killed in the same car wreck back in '62 that we'll never meet. He gets into the sport, and uh, he has three fights. He won his first one. Lost his second one, won his third one, but I, and he was going to fight in a tumble, a guy named Theo Brooks. He called me up that night. I've never, I wasn't an ultimate fight guy. Still, I take it or leave it. I, he wasn't, he, I wasn't an ultimate fight guy. He calls me up and wants me to be his cornerman. So we, we, we're, we're, we're two guys about the same age. We see each other around. We're not real good friends. We see each other around. And uh, I said, all right, man, whatever. So we go over there and. He beats Theo Brooks. He was lucky to beat Theo Brooks. He, he got a bad cut in the fight. He got a cut over his eye. The referee could have stopped it, but he goes ahead and beats Theo Brooks. Um, after the fight, he says, hey, man, uh, I need somebody to help me out. I need somebody. I mean, he's going to get an extreme challenge heavyweight title fight versus Andre Roberts. An extreme challenge is uh, an upcoming, it's the second largest organization in, in, the, war, in the United States. UFC's first. Extreme Challenge, Monty Cox is the second longest running show in the United States. So I got a fight against Andre Roberts. I need you 
you know, I need somebody. He knew a track athlete. I need somebody to run with. So I was kind of skeptical because I saw his fight. And the only fight I saw him fight was a fight he lost on tape. Mm. He looked horrible. He got beat by a guy that he shouldn't have got beat by. He's fat and out of shape. I said, whatever, man. And that summer, <clears throat> I was kind of skeptical. And that summer, he, uh, that was in May. And in August, when we showed up for that fight, I mean, he, he, he looked like a whole different cat. Mm. It was, and why I was running with him, I mean, let's talk about the elephant in the room, but I'm not going to detail what was going on, okay? Mm -hmm. But I had the guy in shape. We yeah. went down and ran. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the guy, the promoter didn't know who the hell he was. He walked in there. I mean, it was, the, it was a Mr. Clean-looking Bobby Hoffman. Yeah. But we, uh, we got the opponents changed, Andre Roberts back. See, Andre Roberts weighed 300 pounds. And our, our, uh, our fluff was, we're going to go out and condition this guy. So we're going to train like a marathon. In the old Extreme Challenge days, it was one 15-minute round, a one minute break, then a five minute round. And if it went to distance, automatically called a draw. So if you see all these old schoolers, all the draws on their, on their record, that's why. Mm -hmm. Extreme challenge, there was no judges. It was like, it, you either knock the guy out or it was a draw. <laughs> I think that's, that's true. I don't think that's that old school. That wouldn't but, pass today. No, no. But uh, you know people are going for the finish then. Yeah, yeah, oh absolutely. There was no, there was no judges. Like, and look at, look at some old schoolers' records. Travis Fulton, he's got a ton of fucking draw. And so uh, Andre backed out of the fight. He had a sore hand or something anyway, and Hoffman was pissed because they, they, uh, he never did trust Monty. He said, they're bringing in ringers on me. They brought in Kevin Costner's bodyguard, who was a kickboxer from California. And uh, he's almost backing out of the fight. I said, man, you got to do this. Fuck you, I mean, we train, we got to do this. All right. But we said, uh, we're in good shape. You know, the humidity is going to get to this California boy. And uh, if, 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 if it had been later in his career, he would have, he would have hammered him easy. <clears throat> but he, uh, he finally got the kicked out boxer down, pounded him out, <clears throat> and he became Extreme Challenge heavyweight champ. And Extreme Challenge heavyweight champ was a big belt because it was a st stepping stone in the UFC. Mm. And so you mentioned Monty Cox. Monty Cox was the promoter. He's a, he was promoter, and he was actually Bobby's manager, too. I wasn't actually Bobby's manager. I was his cornerman, conditioning coach. I was a go-between between Bobby and Monty because there was some friction there, and Bobby just, Bobby's Bobby, if you know what I mean. He, For those he who don't like know you. Bobby, what, how, would you explain, like how would you explain Bobby? How can you explain Bobby? <laughs> he's an athlete. He's, he's, he was a great athlete. Yeah. The guy, we talked about this on the phone, the guy should be in the Athletic Hall of Fame. Yeah. But uh, small-town rumors got to you know. They, they want you to be a choir boy to get in the Hall of Fame. Right. And he should be in there. The guy played Division One football. He was in the Shrine game. Mm. He, uh, he was a good wrestler. And he, and he should be in there. Let's say Bobby Hoffman moves out of town in 1985. And you'll hear from him 10 years. The rumor mills don't catch up with this guy. And he's in the Hall of Fame. Right. That makes sense? Yeah. And, and, and his picture should be there. And uh, there should also be a picture of how he was a pioneer in, in MMA. Yeah, I agree. Um, so you guys are, Monty Cox is getting you guys fights. So you guys are traveling all over, and this is where some this of was, At first, it, it was kind of, we wouldn't get many fights, and yeah. it was frustrating. I mean, it was kind of because we were ready to go. I mean, is that was, because it wasn't a big scene, or? I don't. Well, we he had a, he had a he had a uh, he had a first title fight or defense in October that year. He beat the piss out of that poor guy. I think he sent that guy in retirement. <laughs> we saw a film of this guy. He was a submission guy. He was going to lay on his back and try to submit him. It was a bad matchup for him. Bobby really hammered him. Give him a, give him a pounding. Because Bobby was a stand-up guy. He was a ground and pounder. Yeah. At first, he was a ground and pounder. Did Bobby wrestle? Yeah, he got fourth in state in wrestling. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, He's a, deck of a heck of a dirty boxer, too. You get, yeah. he put, he'll put your pressure up against yeah. the cage and toast At on. first, it wasn't like that. It was all ground and pound. When we was traveling, it was all ground and pound. It was phenomenal to watch him grow on his feet. Mm -hmm. It really was. No, he, at first he was just a, a mauler, get you on the ground and pound you out. That's what his style was. But he, uh, he eventually, he got where he was tougher than hell on his feet. He had a, yeah. developed a health and knockout punch. Yeah, he, he had a lot of power, but he'd also, you know, put you up against the cage, put his weight on you, yeah. toe stomp you, and lots yeah. of elbows and lots yeah, of he, stuff yeah. inside. Oh, yeah, he, yeah. He was a fighter. The guy's a fighter. And, it, and he, he developed that, you know, throughout – you know, he evolved into that type of guy. At first, he knew very little. 
before we get into like you guys flying around the whole country, you guys went to Burlington, Iowa, and one of my that was it. One of but my, he beat that poor Paul well. One of my oh, favorite uh, stories in that is the ticket story. Yeah, what happened there? See, like, like your cousin Mike gets big support. Mike yeah. Engley, he's got a cousin. He gets big support. Centerville, we got no support. Mm-hmm. I mean, people thought this sport was fucking disgusting. He's a hoodlum for doing it. What's he doing? You know, he's a villain. I mean, he was yeah. a villain. People didn't like it. So anyway, I got asthma. I don't have to do coke. But anyway, <laughs> he, uh, so I get Monty Cox, I order 50 tickets. Bobby's got this big thing. He's had to sell all these fucking tickets. He, and uh, I sell like four fucking tickets. There's like four <laughs> people in the the crowd yeah. watch this guy pound this poor son of a bitch. But anyway, he, uh, so before the fight, I go, here, Monty, uh, I only sold four tickets, man. All right, you just take the tickets you got. The ticket master up front. Well, I, I gave him about half of them. I stuck there in my pocket. Went out and did a little scalping, you know. So we have a little beer and hotel money for after the fight. You know? Yeah, you said you made like you made two hundred dollars. Yeah, I made a couple hundred yeah. bucks. And you said you don't you don't regret it. You're like I don't regret it. Mon, Monty probably he probably Monty probably frowned on it, but oh well. Monty's making big money off Bobby. So I'm sure Monty get over it. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things, but you talked about like Mikey having support and stuff. It's kind of crazy because Mikey's got that kind of the recipient of what like you talked about Bobby Trailblaze but for the pioneer, sport. Yeah. So it made it popular. He was one of the people that made it popular worldwide. But I remember growing up with Mikey, you know, my brother, he had videos, VHSs that we rented, you know, from the video, whatever rental place of Bobby, you know, fighting King in the Cage or Pride yeah. Fighting or yeah. all, all those big shows, you know, so. It's pretty cool that he, you know, he paved the way, and he's from yeah, Central, he and Mikey's, you know. And, and that's why I say he, maybe, maybe the museum out here one of the days give him his due when he's dead and gone, you know. But mm. the guy was, uh, <clears throat> I mean, he was, uh, he was the best in the world. He's ranked 16th in the world one time. He's an underrated guy. I mean, yeah, uh, he, he, his style of fighting, defend the takedown, take a punch, and throw a punch, that'll be effective in heavyweight division till, till the end of time. Because he always got that puncher's chance, and he'd never been flattened in a fight. I mean, he had a... You could hit him with a two by four. It's not going to hurt him. His problem was sometimes he just didn't like to train after I after I was out of scene. But I always had that guy in shape. When he showed up, he was in shape. So is it true that his career in fighting started because he was at an event just watching and uh, a fighter didn't make weight or didn't show or something? There was a local guy in town named Clayton Miller. He basically got the sport started. I think Bobby went to a show with him. I wasn't there. And I think he, he filled in for somebody. Yeah, like they asked, does I, anybody want to fight I from the crowd? So. See, I, I, I wasn't around then. Okay. I wasn't around then. That was, that was his first, first fight against, yeah, I wasn't around then. So, so you had, you know, the whole steroid thing going on. You had the Bobby Hoffman, you being his cornerman thing, flying all over the country. Were you still able to run your steroid operation oh, yeah. during all this? Just the weekend. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, I mean Salt Lake City, that'd be a weekend thing. Yeah. You know, or Hawaii, that'd be a weekend thing, sure. Yeah. Let's talk about the Hawaii trip. So Super that's, Bowl 13. Super Bowl 13. So that was, uh, that was like his big, that, that was like a $10,000 cash prize, right? That made, yeah, that tournament made Bobby Hoffman. Yeah, so what was Super Bowl well, 13? Well, it was, uh, it was a battle, of, there was a big event, I mean, but there was more than the heavyweights fighting, but it was called the Battle of Young Heavyweights. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the winner got ten thousand dollars. Loser, second place got fifteen thousand, fifteen hundred. Excuse me. Mm. And uh, the first night of the fight of the night, he fought a guy named Rico Rodriguez, who went on to be UFC champ. Yeah, and, uh, and he was the uh, he was the uh, Abu Dhabi champ too. All, we didn't know what that meant. That, yeah. We had no idea. That's how backwards we were. Yeah, we weren't in the locker room saying, "Hey, you know, this guy's got submission hold." But we we had no clue. We, <laughs> all, we didn't know what it was. We thought it was just some. But he went out there and. Uh, well, the Abu, for those who don't know what the Abu Dhabi champion is, like, that's World like that's like the Super champion. Bowl of, of jiu-jitsu. Wrestling. Yeah, basically it's jiu-jitsu submission wrestling. And that you, we you guys know. are wrestling the best guy in the world, or you guys are fighting the best guy in the world. Yeah, I, 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 I can reassure you there was no commentary in the locker room. Hey, let's watch this guy's submission. Well, there was nothing. Yeah. We didn't know. I mean, yeah. that's we didn't really care. So what was the game plan? Go out and knock his fucking head off. That was Bobby <laughs> Hoffman's game plan. Every time. And, and how, did it, how did it go? It went on. Uh, it was back and forth for a while. Rico was a good wrestler. Bobby finally uh, he, he got his first knockout. He hit he hit him with a big right hand, and he went and took a knee. And what's what's kind of funny about that fight after I watched it? In high school, I watched Bobby Hoffman have a, a fight down at the local park, mm. and it was almost eerie how how similar it was. There was this new kid come in. He was a, he was a senior, 
And of course, Bobby, I don't know, something happens. We had a challenge down at the park. And this kid was whipping Bobby. He was jabbing him, jabbing him. Bobby threw a big right hand. And that kid went, took a knee, and it was almost the exact same thing what happened in a Rico fight. It, did, was, it was pretty eerie, really. Did you talk to Bobby about that? Did he remember that? Oh, he remembered. Oh, yeah. 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 That's only, that's, I, we talked about his fights in the park. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it started. That's his amateur career. Yeah, we talked about that. Went he, to, over on Devil's Hill. No, it was right in front of, uh, no, it was right, almost right so when, when you pulled in the park. Yeah. Right, right there by the. I was right up front there. The we, didn't, we didn't hide it back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like right, right on the main street. That's usually where those happen. The, the, all the yeah. high school fights, right there. He's closest to, from the high school. He's walking. Yeah, right yeah. We had a big crowd. Yeah. Teachers asking who won. <laughs> yeah. Did he ever lose any of those fights? I, I, I probably. I, I don't know. Yeah, there, there was a kid in my, my, in my class who used to give him pretty good tussle. Yeah, where's yeah. that guy now? I don't. I think he's up in Des Moines. His name was. Yeah, he was a pretty tough kid. Yeah, yeah. But but Bobby wasn't Bobby then. You know? Yeah, I mean, he he wasn't hooked up with. Uh, he wasn't, he wasn't hooked established. Up with, but anyway, the Super Brawl 13, he beats Rico Rodrigo. Rico goes on to be UFC champ. In his next fight, he fights a kid named Heath Herring, and we're do he's dominating the fight. But uh, it, it was clear across the ring. It was in a boxing ring, and I'm in the corner, and uh, I didn't see it, but. This kid got him in like a submission hold. Bobby posted his arm and this kid snapped Bobby's elbow. And uh, I thought, and I didn't see it. And Bobby comes back to the corner and he said, that fucking kid just broke my elbow. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, he broke my fucking elbow. I'm like, oh man, and it was like, oh shit. And I said, and it was never, it was never throwing the towel with him. The towel was just to wipe some of him off. That was the rule, never throw in the towel. <laughs> So we, we, he went out there, he threw the kid down, and, and he, uh, he won that fight. But, he snapped uh, his elbow in the fight and won, won the up, same he fight. He won that fight. He got him down. But, and in the next fight, we had a fight, Josh Barnett. And, uh, I mean, in between the fight between Herring and Barnett, uh, we, had, we tried to doctor his arm up the best we could. I mean, it was literally, I mean, you could tell, I mean, he was sick. I mean, he, he, we literally thought he broke his arm. We got an x-ray lay, on it later. It was severely sprained, but the guy could barely lift his arm. Mm. And uh, when it comes to that Super Brawl, I'll watch the Rico fight, I'll watch the Herring fight, but I don't watch the Barnett fight. Because mm. it was, uh, he took an ass beating, or he really did. How much time did you guys have in between fights? Probably, I, I can't remember, maybe 45 minutes of that. <clears throat> yeah. If, if, in that three hour time span, he fought three of the toughest guys in the world. I mean, yeah. He, he so he he ended up winning that last one or he no, just, he, no Josh, he, he lost Josh, Josh, and, and what and I remember being in his corner and he was he was a sick fighter when we were in there he had a great look in his eyes and I remember him looking at the clock just trying to survive the round and uh, on the plane trip home man he got like he had a, to make a long story short he got like five hundred dollars for that because he had to pay his money his twenty percent he had to pay his flight out there and all this shit you know so and, and I'm in his ear on the way home I'm saying hey man. We're going into professional wrestling. Fuck this shit. We always wanted to do it anyway. You know, go to, so he would have been a good professional wrestler. He looks like a hoodlum. I would have been a, he said, you big great manager. You look, you know, you piss people off. You got that, you know, and that was kind of what, and after that, he's like, I'm not going to watch you get your arm broke for 500 bucks, pal. And this is, this is some bullshit here. And, uh, but when we got back home, the, uh, a, a reporter from uh, a magazine called, and I talked to him earlier. Yeah, I seen him at the pool in Hawaii before the fight. Anyway, uh, he wanted to do an interview with Bobby, and they did a big write-up about uh, how he was the toughest man on the planet. Because of the elbow. Because of the elbow. <clears throat> and it made him. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, and people realized then that, hey, uh, if you're, if you're going to get in a cage with this guy, a ring this guy, he's, uh, he's going to have your hands full. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember after the fight, man, this may sound, but, you know, I carry how to get him back to the locker room i mean he's i get him in the shower he's puking blood and shit all over. i mean this guy barnett pounds him i mean but bobby does pretty well for one arm and when you look at that fight he's a one-arm fighter i mean people make see that shit on the internet make comments about it he had one arm literally one and he he did pretty well but josh big strong kid i mean he lost he's a ufc champion yeah ufc Blue. champion he fought two ufc champions one night plus he's there he's a world-class fighter at fought in pride i mean i don't, I don't think he's been in mma's history fought three tougher guys in one night i really i want to see if that yeah so you guys um 
also, I want to talk about too, like a lot of people, you know, especially with UFC getting bigger nowadays, everybody's like, I want to be a fighter on refire. Sure. But you talk about in the book, going back to the hotel after that Josh Barnett fight and like what that looks like. A lot of people don't realize yeah, I mean, what that looks like. Especially that locker room. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was, I mean, uh, that was the first fight. I mean, like Salt Lake City, he got his nurse, first knockdown in Salt Lake City. He's starting to develop on his feet, you know, and it was just party after the fight, you know, and good time. But yeah, I mean, that was the first, like, hey, this shit, this shit's brutal, man. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, all, we're on the wrong end of this one. And so Monty was paying you guys too to go out there, or like, how did you fund like your end? Because I'm sure he wasn't I didn't, paying. I didn't take money. I, even yeah. when I managed fighters later, I didn't take money. It, it was just something for me to do. I mean, this, yeah. I mean, you know, you get to travel the world with a fighter. I mean, you can't put a price tag on that shit. I mean, you know, you can't. Mm -hmm. Did you ever pick up clients uh, while you were going? I out? had one. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One guy. Yeah, he yeah. used to call me. He used to call me back in the day. I'm not gonna say who he is. He, he was in the UFC. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, what's crazy about the UFC is like. They just started testing not too long ago, so a lot of those older guys yeah. have now been in trouble. Their tests would have been easy to beat anyway. Yeah. I, yeah, I think. Like well, I say, water bait. Yeah, they've been easy to beat. What do you think about um, when people talk about, like for baseball, for instance, the summer of 98 when you had Mark McGuire, <laughs> Sammy baseball. Sosa, you think it's good for the sport? It saved baseball after the 94 strike, whether you like it or not. I mean, it brought people back in the stands. Yeah. And it really wasn't illegal then. I mean, it, they really – the government leaked those people's names on it. That was supposed to be confidentiality. They took tests. That was called the what report? The Mitchell, Mitchell report? report. Yeah. Yeah. What do you say to the people though who would say that the guys who don't want to do the steroids, like to them? Here's my thing about steroids, man. You can't give a carnival point. You can't give a carnival pony steroids and think he's going to win the Kentucky Derby. Mm -hmm. You know, people think. I mean, he might be the fastest of the carnival ponies, but he's never going to be able to run with the thoroughbreds. People get this misconception. I get this all the time. Boy, if I knew he was doing that, I would have took steroids, got in a cage. I'm like, when he done any good, he just been some fucking thug bum, you know, on steroids in a cage. And mm -hmm. it don't make you a great athlete. You know, mm -hmm. if that makes sense? Yeah. It really don't. <clears throat> some people got this misperception. Hey, if I shoot up, I'm going to be this great athlete. They'll make a great, good athlete great better, but. Steroids, if, if you can't walk and chew bubble gum at the same time, it's not going to help you out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. The steroid thing, should it be legal? I don't know. Somebody like Alex Smith, yeah, he's had 15 surgeries and he wants to bounce back. You know, he got a, he got a uh, quarterback depleted league like the NFL. If he wants to take it, help, whatever. Mm -hmm. There's some NFL guys that help their body recover. I mean, I, I, those are big monsters crashing into each other. If they, got, they need to take something, I'm glad they're legalizing marijuana. Yeah, you know, because that that that'll help them. But I don't know if it should be legal. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's that's a not to, for me to decide. Yeah. So then the whole Bobby, you know, Bobby's doing his thing. He's going up, and I feel like your steroid, you know, is going up at the same time. Do you kind of connect those together when you think about like those memories? <coughs> oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. They kind of go hand in hand. That, that 1999 was a real fun year for me. Traveling the world. Yeah. Went to, went to see my boys over in Russia. Yeah. So yeah. Ukraine, excuse me, Kiev. So you're getting this, you have this good relationship um, with the Ukrainians now. Yeah, they I, like I, you. you. Before say, the Hawaii I'm, fight, I flew to Kiev. It was before the Hawaii fight? Before the Hawaii fight, I flew to Kiev. And you said in the book, like, none of your family here even knew that. No, I, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't tell anybody. Would they? You were gone for like a week. I was gone for a week. I, I should, looking back, I should have told my daughter because I called her and I got back in New York. She was kind of stressed, you know. But if looking back, I should have, probably should have told her. I know she even at five years old, she could have kept a secret. I should have told her. Yeah. But see, I had a brother living in Fairfield. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought I was just probably stashed out of his place for a week. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so you take off. You. Why? I would do that once in a while. Though I would disappear once in a while. Why'd you go to Kiev? I want to move. I always, I always want to go see the old Soviet Union. I always thought it'd be fascinating. And it was fascinating. I got to be real good. I got to be real good uh, friends with my partner. At first, it was all by letters how we communicate. And he got a phone, and we call each other. I'd call him. We talk about politics, besides other stuff, sports. I knew about the Klitschko brothers before anybody knew about the Klitschko brothers. You know, the <laughs> boxers. I knew when they were up and coming. You know, we talk sports. We talk politics. Our families. We become good friends and. Uh, I was his right hand man, uh, and he wanted to meet me, and I wanted to go over there. So, was there um, in the book you, you you call him Oleg, and it's in yeah, Prissy, so we're not going to say his real name. But he, you guys built this kind of relationship. He liked you, he trusted you, so he he allowed you to stay at his house. Oh yeah, oh, absolutely. What that what that look like? 
Oh, you've seen the pictures. Nice house. Yeah. Real nice. Out in the, it's outside the outskirts of Kiev. Real nice. The Ukrainian government wasn't like, how is he? Did he have other hustles or like, how did they? They didn't say, how does he here's get the, this Here's how out? stuff works in Ukraine. Like, you, you, if if I ask you what you do for a living, you don't ask that over there. Yeah. You don't you don't ask what people do for a living over there. There's and no and, and if you tell on somebody, you either move away or disappear. That's just the way. It's real hush hush. Like, I ask, I'll ask, I'd see a guy, what's he do? So we don't know. We don't ask. That's just the way it is. You just yeah. don't ask questions. And he spoke fluent English. Fluent better than you and me. And you spoke no Ukrainian. And I spoke no Ukrainian or Russian. Okay. And so you go there. See, their their, their theory over there is uh, English is the uh, language of business. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to do merchants, if you want to do business, you better learn English. And he was in the business. Any kind of business, though. Yeah. And if you want to make money, you got you know English is the the language you got to know to make money. And so he was kind of just showing you, it wasn't really, you weren't really handling business over there. It was just a no, pure pleasure it was trip. August, all, all the mobsters in uh, August go on vacation. There's no, there's no, it's vacation time. Yeah. It's kind of the, it's kind of the Ukrainian way. Huh. They, his son went to the Black Sea. What's that? To see down in the Black Sea. Oh, it's sea. an actual thing? Yeah, Black oh, Sea. I thought it was like, a, like slang for something else. Huh? I thought it was slang it was for- vacation. No, okay. they all went to- the Black Sea for vacation, and, and uh, it was vacation time in Ukraine in August. And I, I got a question I want to ask you about. Um, he had a friend that he took you to, and he said he wasn't like a rich guy, didn't speak English. He was English. a professor. Professor. And um, he had a girlfriend or something like that, right? Yeah, she was pretty friendly. I showed you pictures of her. Yeah. I don't think she was actually a girlfriend. I think it was just kind of a mutual thing. Yeah, friends with benefits, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Good for him. So you took him... Well, first of all, talk about the McDonald's. So you guys go to McDonald's, and in, in the book, you act like this is like the freaking... Yeah, it, yeah, McDonald's, uh, it was it was spotless. I mean, it was phenomenal. I asked him why, he said, well, you know, it's an American business. People take pride in working for an American business. I mean, it was spotless. It really yeah. was. yeah. And at some point, you know, you're kind of killing it. You guys, I don't know if you've been drinking or what, but you, uh, you're you having a good time. The the girl that's with you, is, or that's with him, it's the professor's girlfriend. You go to the bathroom and what happens? She uh, She's waiting for me outside the door trying to proposition me. And I'm like, this shit don't happen to me back home. I was kind of taken aback by it. And I kind of didn't want to push her off, but I had to, you know what I mean? Yeah, you said I'm not a buddy fucker. <laughs> in, the, in the book, you said plus that. I did, plus, I uh, did. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to disappear. I didn't know how serious the relationship was, you know? Yeah, so that's what I was thinking about. In the book, in the, in the book, I actually wrote it down. Do you think that was a setup to see if you were, like, no. trustworthy? Uh, no, I got home. No, I got home. That's I said, what I would do. I would try to, like, hey, go in there. And I, see got, I, got, I got home. I said, hey, bud, you know, uh, what's her, what was her name? You know, Oksana, come on to me after the bathroom. You know what he said? What? Oh, you should have told me. We wouldn't God picked her up for you. <laughs> He, my buddy was married. Yeah. My, the main guy, my buddy was married, had kids. Yeah. But, nah, but it, you know, you go to third world country. I mean, you're, you, you don't, you, you don't want to stick out. You don't want to cause any major, you know, you yeah. keep, let, keep low. No, no. Were you like in super shape back then? Decent. Yeah. Decent. Huh. So then uh, after that whole trip, you come back. Did people say, where were you? Did you tell people around nah, here? People don't care. You didn't my tell mom, anybody? My mom, no. Nah. Yeah. Nobody. I disappeared for a week. Nobody. No. Yeah. And so this is in 99. Then you guys go to Hawaii. Yep. And then um, at some point, so you originally got in trouble in 96. Um, three years later, you get a re they ended up bringing the charges back in 1999. Um, you're doing your whole thing. How much longer until the Unionville uh, arrest? Uh, three months after Super Bowl. Super Bowl was the last time I was in Bobby's Corner until actually got him a fight in 206 in Cedar Rapids. Mm. After uh, November, like two days after Thanksgiving, I knew a big shipment was coming, and uh, I come out of the post office. Well, Friday, I went and got a one box, and uh, I knew more was coming. I went back Saturday, and I, knew, I had a bad feeling. There was a lot of cars parked up on the square that day, and I come out of the post office with, 40,000 tablets of Dianabol, and they surrounded me. <laughs> yeah. This is in Unionville? This is Unionville, Missouri. And so Unionville, because you had different post PO boxes, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So you had this, you had this weird, like, instinctual... I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. It, like, there was small town square. Nobody was there, and there was a lot of cars uptown. I kind of had this yeah. feeling about, like, ah. 
See, my thing was it was all getting shipped with in, in USA borders, and I was like, you know, real, technically they can't get in your mail, but they was doing some bullshit investigation on me. I thought the search warrant. I thought the search warrant was bullshit. Mm-hmm. I thought it was all hearsay bullshit. Search warrant. I went through a motion to suppress. I lost the motion to suppress. I did seven months in the county down there, and I did four months in the Missouri Penitentiary. What made them? They did somebody tip them off, or yeah, the cop in Centerville. So he kind of he kind of had his eye on you. He kind of knew, and they kind of got some they kind of got some hearsay evidence. My my the attorney that I had down there was actually a judge. He said he got a shot to beat this. You know, I wouldn't have signed the search warrant, but small town, you know, mm-hmm. they ain't gonna let that. They, they didn't let it slide. And so you had all that those packages. You go out to your car, and is it just like the movies? Just like the movie. Yeah. What was going through your head? Keep my mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> First thing I said was, "I need a lawyer." Yeah. In the book, you never really talk about like being bummed about being in jail or anything it always just seemed like you were just kind of like level-headed and like let's get it's not fun you know but i mean you know it uh it is what it is i mean you just got to deal with it my thing was even though they threatened to throw the book at you they can't keep you forever Mm -hmm. and they were they were so i got called all they were threatened i don't know 15 to you know five to 15 years i mean they're threatening all this shit and just Keep a level head, and they, they can't keep you forever. That's my, plus, I thought I was going to beat the case. I, mm-hmm. I still think to this day that the, the, the search warrant was BS. Mm-hmm. Did, so they, they waited for you. They didn't want to intercept the packages because they wanted you to, to have them? Yeah, they didn't, really, they didn't know what was in them. Mm-hmm. They, 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 just, they, they had sus- reasonable suspicion, and that's why I fought the search warrant. Was it like state police or who? And the postal inspectors. Too. Postal inspectors, okay. Yeah, it was reasonable suspicion why they stopped me. And then, so you did what? Seven months in Unionville. Seven months. See, my bond was one hundred fifty grand. That's what. That's what kind of irks me about that case. My bond was one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Had a guy next to me. He he was fucking around with his kids, and his bond was fifty thousand. <laughs> and I get the Kansas City paper. And there's murders that their bond was seventy five. It's a good old boy system. I won the good old boys because I basically told her, you know, screw your search warrant. I don't. They said fuck you, and they didn't like that. <laughs> So then you did seven months in there. What's that? What's the Unionville jail like? It was uh, like a dungeon. Didn't yeah. get to see no sunlight. Yeah. It sucked. Yeah. Didn't did, get to see my kid. It sucked. Yeah. Because you said in the book you don't you didn't want your family coming and no, seeing there. No, I, I had visitors in jail, but any time I got sent to the pen, there was no visitors. Been never. I wouldn't let them go through that prison gates. No way. Mm-hmm. And you, so you finally, you know, eventually you end up getting out. You did seven months. They, uh, they got rid of your bond or something like that. Or yeah, no? I got bonded out. Yeah, yeah. I thought the search warrant lost. I bonded out. I thought I'd get probation. Can you uh, talk about after you originally got put in Unionville jail? Uh, you made a phone call to somebody to, for the money that you had. Yeah. So what? I had some money stationed in the safety deposit box. And luckily, I had a her name on it. That was a that was a. Uh, that was a big win for me. I had like twenty, twenty-five thousand, maybe thirty thousand dollars stash in a safety deposit box, and my sister went and got it. And what'd she do with the money? <laughs> she hid it for me. <laughs> yeah, she hid it somewhere. She hid it for me. I got it back. Yeah, I got it back. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the next day, you had a visitor from the police, and they about the safety deposit box. What yeah. happened? What happened? Also, there? Had a, I didn't talk about them. But there was also. The Centerville cop was on me about the prescription tab pads, too. They knew about that, too. Yeah. They knew. I told him, ah, I didn't want to talk about that either. Oh, yeah, he, he wanted to know what was in a safety deposit box. And I told him nothing because I knew my sister got in. <laughs> he said, well, uh, we're going to cut it open. <laughs> do what you got to do, man. No, no, whatever. Too late. Too late. That was big. That saved me. A day late. Paid all my fines, and that was big. A she day late, a big 30 grand short. She did me a big favor. Wow, so that felt like a win. That's a win. Yeah. <laughs> did that? Did that stuff? Did that like make you happy whenever you could kind of trick him or whatever? I didn't make me. Ha- I was just happy to have that money because I knew it was gonna get me out of a pinch. Yeah. You know, I had a lot of fines to pay, and you know, you spend a day in jail. They pay, they they make you pay for your day in jail in Missouri and Iowa. And I knew I needed money to get myself out of this jam. Yeah. I feel like every time that uh, like this kind of that whole thing. You were smart enough to know that. Like, I would have already thought that money was already been gone or frozen. Nah, nah, that, 
you can't give the police too much credit. They don't know any, everything. That's why you keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Did you, <laughs> in the book, you were always kind of, when I was kind of telling people about you, you were always like street smart about stuff. You talk about keeping your mouth too shut. Too brave. So that, that's my problem. Too brave. You talk about keeping your mouth shut. Let's go back to your, what, senior year of high school, the incident with the pool? Yeah. That was my junior year. Yeah, we, uh, our baseball team decided that uh, Centerville Swimming Pool needed a can of oil-based paint in the middle of it. <laughs> we would have got away with it. I didn't tell anybody. Man, I mean, I'm, I'm, I didn't tell my sister or brother, but everybody started telling their girlfriends. And, boy, and next thing you know, we're all down at the police station. So. And your job in that was to – I was like, the lookout. Yeah. And somebody finally squealed and you guys – Oh, I mean, they – I mean, people start telling their girlfriends, Senator Eliya, when their girlfriends are going to tell you know how it is. And you said from that day forward, keep, you didn't do any dirt, you better keep it to yourself. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to make sure we had that in there. The, the Unionville thing happens. What I always thought was interesting with you was after every time you got in trouble, you get on the phone and you call the Ukrainians and say, I'm still going. Yeah, yeah. And when I got, when I bonded out for that four months, I just had stuff sent to another guy's house. I mean, it was just business as usual. I thought I was get probation. Mm -hmm. And they sent me down. And uh, when I got out, went back into business. And then after 9-11, that changed everything. We couldn't, I mean, there was, they, customs, you can't smuggle anything in it anymore. Mm -hmm. So 9-11, I feel like that whole, that changes it for everybody yeah. in every I mean, industry. It's, it's trivial that I couldn't smuggle steroids anymore because, you know, people lost their lives. Yeah. But that was a big, yeah, I mean, it's, that changed the whole, that's changed the whole security system in the United States. I mean, you got the Patriot Act, you got all this stuff now. I mean, that that oh, that was a game changer. So I feel like at that time, a lot of things changed for you. 9-11 changed your guys' whole, like, business model. Yeah, after that, I was pretty much done as a, as a big-time dealer. And then um, Bobby's career changed, too, because he was now getting into the UFC. Yeah, and that, that sucked because I, uh, you know, I, I, I could have went on to, went to Europe and seen a bunch of school stuff, but I was done after Super Brawl yeah. until – April or uh, August 2006. Okay. Is that the Sheraton? I can, I, can, I can actually, no, when I got him his last fight. Okay. August 2006, I actually got him that fight. So I can actually say I was his manager at one time. Yeah. And so what year was the Sheraton arrest? That was like 203. No, it was 204. Okay. So 2004. So yeah, I, it was, I was basically doing nothing. I, yeah. I pissed some local cop off. I don't know what the deal. I, to be honest with you, I, I worked out in this weight room, and he pro, he was wanting stuff. And I yeah. told him, no, I don't do it no more. And I think it pissed him off. He did an investigation on me. And, I mean, I was, I basically had, I've had very little in my house. They, they got some warrant again, come in on me, and there was, there was nothing in the house. Very nothing. Yeah. So you were, you were selling, a, you were doing, the, you were, you were doing a, a pretty big, you guys were selling a lot, and then all of a sudden... After 9-11, it was over. It shut it all off. I you, was a nickel and dime guy again. I mean, were see, you I had a job in a factory. Yeah. It was just a supplemental income. Plus. Did you? Were you still getting them from the Ukraine at oh, all? Oh, yeah. Okay, and that's what you were selling? Yeah. Okay, so... But it, was, it was becoming more of an underground lab stuff. Yeah. And uh, you were just selling locally, or did you still have I still customers had my everywhere? customer. People trust. I had a guy in Chicago. This, I had a guy in Chicago. I, I called him, and I got busted in Sheraton. Told him, hey man, you know, and I, I got busted, blah, blah, blah. And he's making an order while I'm getting busted. Because that's how much he trusted me. He yeah. said, he's like, okay, hey man, when you, you, can you get this for me, get this for me, this for me? I'm like, hey, I just got busted. Yeah, I know, but just like, <laughs> <laughs> we know. That's funny. So you, yeah. you know, you get arrested in Sheraton. Can you talk about, you did, so also I'm talking about your, your coaching career a little bit. So you said you had coached uh, some like local level football and whatnot. I was with Hoffman in 98. But, but this kid, this cop. He was a, he was, I, I coached junior high track in Sheraton. He was one of my guys. And when they go in to arrest you, first of all, you got arrested at, again at the, po every time it's the post office. No, this was at the, I got arrested in the weight, weight room. In the weight room. So weight room. post Thank office you. first time, weight room the second time, they bring you to your apartment and they're searching your apartment in front of you. Yeah. And this cop, a uh, young guy. Yeah, he, he, thought, he thought he'd really done something. I had a box of syringes in there. He thought, I, I don't know, he, he got a big heart on over it. And I explained to him, hey, man, it's just syringes. And there's not anything in the fucking. He, he was, said he was like dancing around the room. Yeah, <laughs> he thought he really, yeah, he really thought he did something, man. It, he, he, he got a job with the Highway Patrol after that. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't have any animosity towards some of the cop. This is like two or three of them. Mm-hmm. He's one of them. Yeah. yeah. Screw you, man. <laughs> yeah. So you, the whole Sheraton thing happens. Um, did, how much time did you do for that? I, th- I, th- I only did, uh, well, they, they stuck me in jail. And I did 20 days. My, they, my bond was 50,000 cash for fucking nothing. Mm-hmm. I uh, thought they were going to send me down, but uh, they gave me probation. So what, was that how that jail compared to Unionville and the other jails you've been well, to? Well, they sent me to Osceola. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was like Max Security new one. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it, Unionville was a dungeon. This was like a top of the line new, it was like one of the very few people in that Osceola jail. Because Sheraton had a condemnment because it was, fuck, it was, it was, couldn't pass state standards. Hmm. So you, the whole nickel and dime thing, and I remember you saying like you didn't really feel like you would ever get in trouble for that little amount. Was that like the least amount you were really selling? Yeah, like I mean, it, was, it was nothing. That was, I say just supplemental income. I had three or four steady customers, but it was the, the big time shit was over. Yeah. And so you kind of moved on. You had like a day job kind of at that point. Well, and then I moved out of Sheraton and I come back to Center Hill. You moved out of Sheraton, get a day job. You, um, I actually had a job over in Sheraton. I was working in a factory. I was laid off for a while. And like I say, it was just supplemental income over there. You know? Were you helping Bobby still at this point? No, I was done. I was after Super Bowl, I was done mm-hmm. until I got him his last fight in 206. Okay. I Can missed you, all the European stuff. Yeah. I missed all that. Let's talk about the European stuff with Bobby. So Bobby, there's this big internet rumor going around that Bobby, um, went to go fight Fedor somewhere overseas. In the Japan. internet rumor is that he got there and got scared and became yeah. chicken and left. What happened was, man, he, uh, Bobby Hoffman was 27, four and one at that time. And Fedor was seven and one. This, this was supposed to take place in August of 2001. Nobody knew Fedor, who Fedor is today. What it was, Bobby was pissed off that he wouldn't get paid enough. Mm-hmm. He found out some fighters in the show it was a tournament. I think it was a rings tournament. We're getting paid. We we talked about this after the fact. Mm-hmm. You know, after, you know, we I wasn't in contact with Bobby then. But I I, I blunt. I, what 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 happened to you and Fedor? He said, uh, Well, I go over there, and and the first fight he fights Fedor's teammate, who's a Sambu. It's what it's Sambo. Sambo. World, Sambo World Wrestling Champion. He beats him, and and he finds out that he's got to fight Fedor now, who's on his. his so his corner had been. Maybe send him in there to soften him up for Fedor. You know how this stuff works. Mm-hmm. Plus, he wasn't getting paid enough. And he just said, he basically went on strike. And he said, and then Fedor, I guess, I seen on the internet where he said he was afraid of him. And I'm not saying he could beat Fedor, but he showed up in shape motivated. I mean, he, he, it wouldn't have been easy for him, you know. Mm. When Bobby Hoffman showed up in shape and motivated, he was a handful, period. Mm. Where did you, you said you didn't make it? Where were you at at that point? Were you locked oh, up? Oh, he was. Uh, I was on probation. Yeah. You know, I couldn't. I was, I was out of the picture. He, plus, he was kind of trained with militants then. He was, and then I think he went to California. He bounced out to California. Whenever you guys were going to Utah and everywhere else, you were allowed to leave the state? I went on probation, yeah. Okay. That was just for that minor case. Yeah, I was never. I, I didn't, after I got busted big, me and Bobby were done until mm-hmm. his last fight. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't leave the country. One of uh, Bobby's last fights was the Cedar Rapids story. I got him that one. That was 206? Yeah. Okay, can you talk about that? That was a interesting <laughs> fight. You said that he, uh, you stopped coaching him, but you got him the fight. I got, well, he, he come back from California, and uh, he'd he been out in California. He got some legal jams, and one day he shows up at my house, and uh, I took some kids to the show up there because I, I started managing fighters, and I come to Centerville, local kids, and I took a kid to Cedar Rapids, and uh, the main event of that night was a guy named Chuck Grisby. He's a big heavyweight. I thought uh, he was good, decent guy, undefeated. And, uh, my kid got beat, and I was kind of sitting in the corner pouting about it. I don't know if I got him overmatched or not. I was got him involved with a military kid. He, he was overmatched. Anyway, I saw uh, Chuck Grigsby as the main event, and I thought, uh, boy, I wish they'd get Bob being on him. And uh, <clears throat> he uh, showed up at my doorstep about two months later. I said, I, got, I think I got something for you. And he couldn't wait to get a hold of me. Yeah, because his 
Grigsby's nickname was the Reverend. The Reverend, and Bobby wanted it. <laughs> Bobby wanted to shot the Reverend. Yeah. <laughs> and so you had called up. You got him. You hooked him up with the gym, and uh, no, he got. He didn't train. He didn't train for that fight. Well, you he's, said he's, you called the gym, and they, they said something like he spends more time at the. Oh no! What I called, I uh, so I gave him the fight with the promoters, and so finally he, two weeks before the fight. He goes up there and he trains, okay? I mean, he's big and out of shape then, but I don't care because I, I know he's motivated. He don't like Chuck. There, I can tell he don't like Chuck. I said, this is going to be easy for us. I knew. So he goes up to Cedar Rapids and, and trains. Well, I knew what he was doing. So I have a friend up there I went to high school with, lived in Cedar Rapids. Who, I said, hey, you heard anything about Bobby? He said, well, well, I've heard he's down the strip joints every night drinking. You know, <laughs> I said, all right, as long as he ain't in jail or dead, it will be all right. And, uh, yeah, everything worked out pretty good. Yeah. So, so you, <laughs> you show up. You're there in the crowd, not in his corner, right? You're just in the crowd? Who? You. No, I'm, 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 I'm his corner that night. So you're cornering him. And then um, Grigsby walks out. You say he looks good. He looks like a million bucks. Yeah. Bobby looked like uh he looked like he just got off the bus, man. <laughs> what, <laughs> Bright what did, red hair. What did he looked look like? like Charles Manson with the, without the swats to get, man. He, <laughs> he, looked, he was something else. He was you wearing, could tell he wasn't in training. What was he wearing? He had a pair of, uh, looked, like he, looked like he bought a pair of shorts out of a rummage sale, man. He had some old dingy shorts on. And, and the book he said he was wearing a penitentiary hoodie? Oh, he put on, yeah, he had a penitentiary <laughs> orange sweatshirt and, and, and a Frankenstein mask. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, and he introduced himself as a record of having a record of zero and zero, and he came up with some, he would call himself the, the crazy twisted white boy. I mean, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's just the bizarre world we lived in. Well, guy. he had somebody taken to the ring, yeah, too. Yeah, he, he, he met a stripper <laughs> that, that week, and she was, she had a bull whip. And she was acting like she's cracking a bullwhip, rocking him to the cage. And he was in handcuffs, and he un, he un, she unhandcuffed him, and he went. And it was like, I was like, what? Whatever makes you happy, dude. I, he liked he liked that kind of shit. I was like, whenever I was a kid, one of the, Mikey had those videos of him. That was one of them that we watched. And I was like, what is going on? Uh, how are you? I feel like I'm he like, knew he, it was his grand finale, and he just wanted to do something crazy. Well, see see what sucks about that. That shouldn't have been his grand finale. He won that belt. And we could we could have we could have redone that guy's career. We could have got remade him because you got to think he's forty years old. Then if we could have went back and got him in shape, there's some good fights for him out there. Then there's uh, especially if he's going Kim, by the twisted white boy. Yeah, yeah, Kimbo <laughs> Slice. You know, if we could have got him, Brock Lesnar. You know, there's some big fights out there that we could have. But he went to California, had legal problems again, and then we were done. How you do know? you think those fights would have went if he fought Kimbo or or uh, oh, Kimbo Slice? I think he does very well against Kimbo Slice. Yeah. I think I think in shape motivated Bobby Hoffman could have handled Brock Lesnar. You know, he defend a takedown, throw a punch, and take a punch. I mean that's he, he beat he beat Alistair Overeem and Overeem put uh, Brett Lesnar in retirement. So Bobby Hoffman could compete with anybody. He if he would have done things right, he could have been UFC champ. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Mm. So that whole Cedar Rapids thing that was. Um, 206. Two hundred six. Two two thousand six. Yeah. Okay. So two thousand six. Uh, so that's kind of the end of his career. Yeah, unfortunately. And like I say, he could. We and I. We really didn't need money then. I mean, if he would have stuck around, I could. I you know, I I was traveling with a bunch of local guys in town. I could. I was smart enough then, where I could have got him these fights. We could. Like I say, he went to California, had legal problems again. So. so he went to the UFC. Then he did the two hundred six thing or uh, the Cedar Rapids thing. And then for you, your steroid business, it's down. I mean, it's it's non-existent basically. It's non-existent. What uh, and two o, or I got my last case of trouble was, I started laundering money for these guys. Mm -hmm. So you would, you kind of had this day job, and then you said you wanted more money. You called up the Ukrainians and say, hey, what can I do? They, yeah, I was laid off, and uh, they were they were they got to where they were big time, but I was out of it. I mean, I was pretty much nickel and dime. Their operation really got big, international, big operation. And how they need somebody to handle their money. They trusted me, so uh, if you wanted something, you would mail me the money. I would call my boys and say, or, no, I would get on the internet, email them, say I got their money, and they would send your stuff. And uh, I was handling their money for them. Mm -hmm. That's why they came in on me the last time, money laundering. And how did that, how did they get busted, I guess? Well, the, uh, there's a guy in Pittsburgh named Paul G. Matthews who ran a gym. He uh, 
got caught with a bunch of stuff and he rolled on them. And there's no extradition laws to the Ukraine. So the FBI, they uh, coaxed my boys into going to Cyprus and told them that they were uh, bankers who could teach them how to better launder their money through a bank transaction or something. And uh, my buddy's son and another guy who they blamed everything on, who had, it was a real, I don't know why they did it. They, they, the FBI claims they got the, the kingpin, they didn't get him. But anyway, they busted those guys and me on the same day, St. Patrick's Day, March 17, 2010. So that day, at this point, you had kind of been working the, uh, the door at this bar here in town. Yeah. And uh, you said you go to the laundromat because you had one green shirt <laughs> and uh, you needed to wash I it. I come back and uh, they got they, uh, the local police, DEA, or drug enforcement task force, whatever the local guy. I seen him pull up behind me and he, he jerked me out of my car and a big van full of big DEA agents ran up into my apartment. They had a cop, they had a guy wanting to know, uh, told me they got my boy Muscle Bear, all this stuff. I was like, good for you. I don't know who he is. I don't know the guy. Good for you. But you did. Huh? But you did right. know him? I don't, it, it's, I don't know. If, no, I don't, because it changed since then. I don't know if I did or not. I don't know who, who my... My guy got bigger, but I didn't know who was in charge. And who was Muscle Bear, I guess? I, I don't know. I didn't yeah. ask. I don't know. I don't know if it was my guy or a guy above him. I didn't ask. I was with my I saw those guys in Ohio. But that was some, they, weren't they trying to say that that was some, uh, like a website or something? Yeah, it was. So it that's was. what they are doing all their business through a yeah. website instead of the mail. Yeah. Okay. And so. But how it would work is, like I say, you'd email them want your stuff but you send me the money and i'd handle the money and once i got the money you would get your stuff from somebody and you would you would mail that money to the ukraine i'd wire it to uh yeah ukraine or i'd send it to another guy in the united states hmm. and um so somebody you know there ended up being like a sting operation and they get you guys you get arrested can you talk about uh um what you found funny about getting arrested that day what elaborate the hardy story Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I got. I, of course, I live next to Hardee's. I'm getting raided. I, I, the only thing I thought, them old people drinking their coffee and shit, and then just talking about a little bit to nothing. All of a sudden, they, all of a sudden, they see these DEA drill, and they had some <laughs> shit in their pants. Man, they blocked. <laughs> they blocked off the whole town on my side of the square. Uh, they blocked off the road. I mean, it was like it was like a SWAT team. They thought, I bet those people. They got their money's worth at Hardee's that day. When you were when you were sitting in the uh, in the truck, and they're raiding everything and they're blocking everything. They want off. they want me to go up to the apartment. I refuse. I said I'm going to jail. I'm not. I'm not. Did you not know it was over? Yeah, I didn't have anything in the apartment. I'm surprised they start. I had I had like a hundred tabs in the apartment, but they they charged me for a state charge. Mm-hmm. Because I filled a hundred tabs. I mean, they had nothing. I was I was pretty much out of it. For people who don't know, it's a hundred tabs like um, that's that's nothing. personal stash. Yeah, or? personal stash. Okay, and so you got a, you got and you know it was over. They came and got that. They take you down. Then they start interviewing you and they didn't interview. I told them I'd talk to them. Yeah, and uh, you got a lawyer at that point. I got a local lawyer. Then I, uh, since it was a Fed case, I called my uh, cousin Mike Kielty out of St. Charles, Missouri. Mm-hmm. And he did a good job for me. And uh, at that point, you were just held up in Appaloose County. I was held up in Appaloose County, but uh, they had to drop the charges on me because they didn't. They sent the evidence to get evaluated in Pennsylvania, and there was no. They had no case against me. Yeah. So all the state charges were dropped. Yeah. And, and anyway, if you're in trouble, usually the feds trump state anyway. They just hung me up because I wouldn't talk. Mm-hmm. And were you in touch with the Ukrainians at all? I. I got I got a message out to him, told him I was busted. Then I did get a phone number and I called him and they said, uh, I wonder what was going on. And they said, Well they got my son he got my son, they got some other guy who they pinned the whole thing on. And uh he said they're fighting extradition, but they're gonna lose. So I knew then that they would uh I thought I thought maybe if they got off the island Cyprus is an island. Mm-hmm. I thought maybe if they escaped off that island, they'd forget about me because I was a nobody. If the, if the kingpins got off the island, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. If they escaped and went, got back to Ukraine, they wouldn't fuck with me. But they were just, my buddies over there were fighting extradition. They were all waiting until 
they extradited them and then they were come get me. Mm -hmm. Makes sense? Yeah. So then, that makes um, sense to everybody? Yes, okay. Well, they, um, then you said in the book that somebody did get off the island, right? In a spy case, they did. A separate, totally separate totally, thing. Totally separate case. But yeah. you were trying to tell them, hey, try that? No. Uh, what happened was my buddies had to go in front of that same judge and let that guy off that escaped. And the, and the United States was pissed at that judge because it really caused a lot. Yeah, because this was a Russian spy, and he got off the island. Mm -hmm. My buddies thought maybe they could beat the case until that happened. And the fucking judge was hard on them. They wouldn't, they wouldn't get a lot of bail out. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So you got, um, you know, you got just kind of sat around and waited until you could get your sentencing. Well, they, I had, I was indicted out of Pittsburgh. I, uh, I got my job back at the local machine shop, and uh, I had to turn myself in uh, May of 2011. 2011. Okay. For for, for uh, yeah. 2011 May. And um, so your sister who got you the $30,000 now has another job. She's got a yeah, job drive in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. And where I really screwed up this time, I had $25,000 in a bank and they got it. I don't know what I was thinking. The state would have never figured out what I was doing. Well, they might tell you that it's not illegal for me to get fucking money in the mail. I can mail you all the money. It's not illegal. They might think it is, but I never... I let my guy never thought that the feds would be peeking in our emails, and that's how they got me. Mm. You know, I just never thought that. And that's how they got us through emails. Mm. Once, once I emailed my buddy, and they found out I was laundering the money, and they flat out told me, the feds told me, we know you, we don't give a shit about your nickel dime operation down here. But when you start, you started my laundering money for these guys. Plus, I was helping, I didn't write about it in a book, I was helping them launder money through credit card transactions, too. It was a real complex scheme. I didn't write about it in the book, it was boring, but I was helping them another way too, and they, that's why they came in on me. That day uh, when they came to your apartment at Hardy's, that was the middle of the day, wasn't it? Like 8.30 in the morning. What, what was it? 8.30 well, I, in the morning. For some reason, I don't remember what it was, but I remember, like, because I grew up down the street. Right? Yeah, down I know street, you did. Yeah, he used to come down and play catch with us every once yeah, in a while. Yeah, I know you did. Come to some of our sporting events. And, uh, but yeah, I remember, I remember like something was going on down there <laughs> and I was like outside or something. And I was like, what's going on? Mom? My mom was like, I don't know. It was, <laughs> Saint it was on a Wednesday. It was St. Patrick's Day 210. Yeah. It was like, it, you might've been getting ready to go to school. It might've been earlier than 830. Right. That's what I, was I got up early. I think it might've been earlier than 830. It was right around 8, 830 in the morning. Yeah, but it was light out. And yeah, it was yeah, light so, out. Yeah, those yeah, light out. Not only were the old people drinking the coffee across, <laughs> there's little kids going you to school that the crowd getting their money's worth too. Good for you. <laughs> John was probably in there getting free water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, free water, and then go down to Brats get some. Oh, fuck. <laughs> so, yeah. So at that point, it was just it was just kind of all over for you. All over. So then you you know what was that drive like to Pittsburgh? That you know. Well, uh, that wasn't real fun. It wasn't real fun. Allegheny County Jail, staying in there wasn't fun. Yeah. But uh, I stayed in Allegheny County Jail for four months, four and a half months. That place, that sucked. And, uh, but I did meet some people I still had contact with, an Irishman. And uh, yeah, a guy from Ireland. I can stay in contact with him. He's a pretty good dude. Then I got sentenced to four and a half. I got sentenced to 20 months in a federal penitentiary. And did you do the full 20? In the Fed system, you do 80. They tell you 85%. It's actually 87.5. Yeah, you, yeah, there's no. Yeah, you got to do it. Hmm. I was sent. Uh, I was bouncing around to like three or four different prisons. I finally wound up in Marion, Illinois. So you would always talked about when you'd get, you know, the Sheraton Unionville every t every time you'd been to jail prior these short stints. You'd get out. You'd call the Ukrainians. Hey, what can I do? What can I do? At this point, were you, was it, were you just like it's it's done? It's over. I was I was in jail with them guys. Yeah. You know, and, and I. In Ohio, the Ukrainians. Yeah, I was in I was in jail with the two guys they got from the Ukraine. Oleg. Yeah, no. The other two. His son and a the guy they pinned it on. I'm I'm gonna hold up this car. I mean, can I hold up this sign that I got over here? Yeah. This is the guy that, that they said was the big kingpin, and you can Google this up on the internet. I'm not a big conspiracy theory guy, but this guy was a professional race car driver, and if you, if you Google his name, all the bullshit comes up that he was uh, this kingpin. But the real story is, you, go, you see all his race car results. The guy didn't even speak English. He knew nothing about steroids, and I don't know why they pinned it on him. They, uh, he looks like your stereotypical Russian. He's big, strong kid, and he, you know, he's got that blonde-haired, blue-eyed look. You know, he looks like, and, and I don't know why they pinned it on him. And here's the thing that 
I don't know why the FBI didn't do it better. They make themselves look stupid because when they arrested this kid, they said he was 34 years old. And in the report, they said this ring's been going on for 20 years. So this fucking kid started this ring when he's 14 fucking years old. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it was it's poor. Why they hung it on this kid, I have no idea. I mean, it, it, he, it, but we, I talked to him. He could speak a little English. He knew he was in trouble and went to Cyprus because they got him on a conspiracy. Because if you're talking about shit and you're going there to meet with somebody about stuff, they can get you on conspiracy. That's how conspiracy works. If I called you tonight and say, hey, man, I got a stash of roids and I want you to just stash it for me, you say, okay, you're in on a conspiracy with me. You're going mm-hmm. down with me. That's the way a conspiracy works. Why he went to Cyprus, he, was a, he had a driver's license to drive my buddy's kid around Cyprus, and then they hung it on him. Hmm. It's, cra- it's, it's the crazy. It's, it's wild. How much time did he do? They did three and a half years. And, and what's, what's bad for them, them poor bastards, we had a... We had a uh, the prosecuting attorney was real nice. He was a nice woman. They was gonna, they was gonna let them kids pay a million dollars and let them go home. Well, she got sick. They brought in some dickhead. And he made him do the whole fucking three and a half years. Mm. But but three and a half years, you no, know, it, it it could have been worse for him. Yeah. So uh, did you guys when you were all in there? Were you guys? Oh, we, we talked in the yard and stuff. I mean, yeah, we just yeah, we. I seen him for a month, and uh, the kid grew up. But I didn't really. I only seen him for a day or two when I was over there. He grew up. I didn't. I would have never recognized him because the only way I knew I was there that I saw a guard that had a Ukrainian. He had an Ukrainian last name. I said, "Well, I'm in here fucking around with you fucking Ukrainians." And he said, "Well, who are they?" He said, "Well, they're right next. They'll be right next to you, pal." <laughs> and I, I, and I told somebody in that unit. I said, "Is Sarai in there?" Is, is uh, he said, "Yeah." And. We talked to each other through the doors, and we saw, we would talk in the yard and stuff. Did they know who you were? Who the Ukrainians that were in there? Did they? Did they? Oh yeah, because I met that kid earlier when I was over in Kiev. Did he recognize you? The other one you? didn't. Did they, they recognize were, you? Well, they knew who I was. I mean, yeah, they rec- they, they recognized me. They knew you were in there they, before they had ever saw you. They knew you were in there, or no? They, they knew I got guard? busted because I told I got a call over there. They knew I, I was busted. Mm-hmm. They didn't know I was in Ohio. See, Ohio, they didn't know I was in there. So they so how they find out the guard the guard tell them no or? I they was in a uh, they was in a unit next to me and every time we go out to uh, break or chow I'd say man is there any fucking Russians in that cell in, in that pod with you is there any Russian they said yeah there is there is the one guy knew and I said well tell him and I and I tell him said so tell him Joe's in the next cell and then we got. We got to see each other in the yard. What shit. are the odds of that? <laughs> I know. That's what I said. <laughs> well, they were dying out of Pittsburgh. They, they, their lawyer was smart and got them out of Pittsburgh, Allegheny County Jail. Cause that place, it's a hellhole. If you Google, Google up Allegheny County Jail in Pittsburgh, I mean, that, that fucking jail is getting sued all the time. Guards beating on people. It's a hellhole, man. It, it's a brutal jail. And their lawyer got them out of there. If I had to do it over again, the judge was going to let me go home that day. But I said, ah, I'm going to start my time now. She said, you can go home. We'll come. I said, you turn yourself in. I said, now, nah, I would never go back. Fuck that play place suck. <laughs> you, um, that's brutal. That's real jail. You did have some good times in there on the softball field. Yeah, man. Yeah, Pete Rose was in the. Uh, they claimed that Pete Rose built the softball field at Marion, Illinois. <laughs> they, they, he, he watched the 1990 World Series in Marion, Illinois, and they called it Pete's team because he basically built that team when the Reds won the World Series. Yeah. They claimed that he. They claimed that he uh, helped. Donate money to help build a softball field. They huh. said the whole time he was in there that he was in the warden's office. Brown knows him too. They said he was fucking. Like, <laughs> <laughs> How was uh, your reputation in jail like being a steroid dealer? We had a, we had a, we had a weight yard and stuff, and I never had a problem making friends. People always curious about the shit, you know. I mean, yeah. You um. I know I was never raped in jail. <laughs> Not, let's, get the, let's get that out right now. No, I was never raped in jail. Okay. I was old. Nobody want nothing. Somebody like you, you get a prom date, but they, <laughs> they didn't want nothing to do with me, man. Yeah, that's why I'm so away, man. <laughs> um, so stay out of trouble till you get older, son. Yeah. Well, after I get the steroids down, then maybe I'll be all right. Yeah, I know. I know people. Want, no, I never got raped. <laughs> okay. Too many um, young guys giving it up. They didn't want me. <laughs> um. So you you know played softball. Um, you just kind of did your time, and uh, you started writing a book. Yeah, I, I, when I wasn't playing ball, I had a real easy job. 
in my meaningless job when I first got there. When you go to the Fed joint, they give you a job. They give you like 20 bucks. No, they give you like $2 a week. That uh, So I decided I was going to write a book. Tell you when to get the book? The, uh, yeah, the original? Yeah, yeah. The original? Yeah, right there, the original. Yeah. So here's the here's the here's the re- here's the real copy. That's the real copy. Um, it's on Amazon, like I said earlier. We're gonna put a put it in the link down below. Uh, but here's what it looks like. I'll let you yeah, show. Yeah, man. That's this is what prison. This is what you buy the commissary in prison, man. I wrote it. How many pages is it there? Do you know? Uh, I've got like four or five, three or four of these at home. Oh wow! So there's multiple. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I can, this ain't all. This ain't the whole book. Wow. I, it printed. Hey, yeah. Look at this. It's pretty cool. It's, I forgot I had this stuck in there. It's the Hoffman. Shit. And so when you got home, you ended up um, just typing it all out, or did they have somebody I had somebody, do it? I had somebody do it. Pretty cool. Yeah. Let's see this. John might want to see that. It's in the book. Yeah. Okay. That's in the book, but you can read it better there. Yeah, it's an article. We'll have to get a better shot of that. I'll let you guys check that out. But, uh, no, I, had, I, I paid a guy to do it. I, I told him I'd keep it on the down low because I didn't want him people frown on him he helped me out with the book you know cause, yeah but i had a guy do it for me i paid him for it he did everything for me i'm not i'm not smart enough to do that but make a uh what well, made you want to write a book I, I don't know why because you know what with the rumor mill with my kid it's out there to see you know you're gonna hear rumors you know about what actually went on shit here's the book if you want to read it Plus, my, my daughter's all for it. She thought it'd be interesting. You know, why not? What was, why I'm doing uh, the interview. I mean, I'll be dead 30 years from now. My grand, my future grandkids find this on the internet, think it's funny. Why not? <laughs> Screw it. You know what I mean? What, what was the craziest rumor you ever heard about yourself? You know, you asked me that and, and, and earlier, and uh, you know, I never really give a shit what the rumors were, so I have to do a good a time. Of course, I always heard, I always people implied that I had my kid on the shit. I mean, no, come on. Yeah. And, That's uh, got to be a compliment, though. Nobody's ever ac- accused me of being on steroids. <laughs> but my, my daughter was a hell of an athlete. That's yeah. why. I mean, she was very good. And people, people, you know, just, th- I think people implied that I had her on it. Yeah. Uh, not, but, yeah, you asked me. That, caught, that was a, I never really stopped to think what people, I never have thought, really cared what people said or thought about me. I mean, I, I just never did. Yeah. Never did talk to th- Take the time to think, hey, I wonder what the rumors are about me. I really don't give a fuck. <laughs> I really don't. I've always lived that way. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of why, like, I, you know, I was kind of intrigued. We talked about, you know, why we're doing the story, you know, MMA and everything tied in with what Zach's doing. But I just think it's really cool just how much you, you, you are yourself. And, you know, that's just unique. You know, you just don't care. And it's just you're you. No, I really don't. I mean, that's just the way I've always, the way it always has been, man. Screw it. And while you're in jail, you talked about um, you guys are waiting to see if the who was the senator or whatever that sold a seat. Oh, Blagojevich. Yeah, his, yeah. Uh, did he? We thought up? he was coming in. No, because uh, they hung him. He, uh, he he got the rule of thumb is if you get more than ten years, they'll send you to a. If you get less than ten years, they'll send you to a camp. I was in a camp. But uh, he got, you know, he, they rung him up. He did like 12 years. They sent him to uh, Colorado. Was there ever any famous cases that were in, that you did time with? Oh, uh, a few, uh, Blagojevich's snitch was in there. Oh, really? How was he treated? Nah, I mean, he was, he was a politician. I don't know, but it, I don't know. There's a lot of snitches in there, really. People say they don't snitch. There's a lot of snitches in there. How are they? By the way, but let me just say, this is the first time I ever wore a wire proudly <laughs> right here. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing I pride myself about. I never ratted. I mean, that. Yeah. I took my beat like a man. I've never ratted. You had a good, another good quote here that I want to read. Okay, the quote says, my counselor's at the Western Regional Diagnostic Correction Center, which is where they were when you did time, right? The, in Missouri. In Missouri. Yeah. They said they would... They would say that being proud of being a trusted drug dealer was nothing more than criminal pride. And you said, I have to give them credit where credit is due. They were 100% correct. <laughs> <laughs> so you're proud of, the, of uh, you know, not snitching. Know. They, were I, trying to, they were trying to coach you guys to snitch. No, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know. When I, let me, when I wrote that book, I was a very angry guy, man. I mean, I was, I'm not angry anymore. I mean, it's, it's over. You know, there's, there's some cops that... I'll even talk to in the streets in my case. There's some of them that I wish nothing but the worst for, and some have gotten 
karma's kicked him straight in the ass, and I'm not going to mention any names, but yeah, it's kicked him straight in the ass, and I'm glad to see it. They were bigger criminals than I were, and they know who they are. There's another quote that you have in there. You said the only thing you regret is getting caught. Has that changed since, or do you? Do you I regret reg the stress I put on my daughter. Yeah, I regret that uh, I missed her senior year. I missed her senior year in softball. Missed her senior year in basketball. She she played for a uh, a real good soft uh, national. She, uh, a team that went to nationals in softball at Kirkwood. You know, it's a top ju ju JUCO program in the country. I missed all of her games. I was on probation. I got to see four of them. She went to the World Series. I didn't get to see that. She played one year. Give it up. She, she's a student at Iowa State. She graduated. So I do miss that time. I never get that back. Would you do it all again or no? I'd write that letter tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd do a few things different, but I'd write that letter. Here's my, here's my theory about life is, man, dollars fill your pockets, but adventures fill your soul. Yeah. I've got a pretty full soul. Yeah. Uh, do you ever get hit up anymore like hey joey you got anything i i get asked um about like austrian shit yeah i mean people but no yeah. they uh i'm done yeah well uh, i got one last question how did you officially get the nickname the needle and who gave it to you <laughs> That's a, that's the last page of the book. Man. Is it? Yeah. So, last so you can't give perfect. that one out, huh? That's last perfect. page of the book. So let's save that one I, for you know, the book. I, nobody, I was never called that in the streets or anything. It's always Dr. Joe. I mean, I, I, that's what I was known by. I mean, I played softball. I'd, I'd give guys pain pills and shit. Hey, Dr. Joe, you got anything to help me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were still doing that in jail? No, I played softball in the streets. Oh, yeah. Before, you know, I, I played a lot of softball. That was a big thing when we were growing up, softball. Yeah. You know, I always had... Players that need a little painkiller or something. I always, I always had a bag full of so feel how, good. So how did you get the, the the last page of the book? You tell you talk about the guy. Can you talk about that? Uh, if you want, I, he was just uh, an old Italian guy who. Uh, let me let me. Yep. Uh, oh yeah, he was. Uh, he's one day we were sitting there bullshitting one day at the uh, table, and he said. I'm gonna start calling him the needle. I go, what? What? Yeah, the needle. I said, what the fuck? Why would you call me the needle, man? And the nickname just kind of stuck, you know. Nobody called me the needle out on the street. People don't think I'm on cocaine, man. It's my fucking asthma. I get drug tested at work. I'm not. I'm not on coke. <laughs> my asthma. My asthma. Medicine, my asthma allergies kind of bother me. Okay. But no, that's why a guy in Marion gave me that nickname. An Italian guy. He. Uh, uh, he had some, I think he had some underworld connections and he just thought it'd be a cute nickname to give me. I don't know yeah. why. <laughs> you, you, I like it. Yeah, I think it's the greatest nickname <laughs> yeah. out there. Fit. My, my, my daughter, she'll call me it once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's she cool. was all right with this interview too. Or uh, Well, first we thought it was going to be a podcast. You don't know about, about all this other stuff. And she, yeah. hey, you want, you want to see the Michael Jordan thing? You want that? Yeah, let's go ahead and bring it on. This, these are called wooden dolls. They're very popular in Ukraine. I don't, know, I don't know if this is the guy's name on it or what. It but in a nutshell, this is how we were smuggling stuff in when, uh, bef when we were uh, in the beginning. These, 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 uh, these would be empty shells. There'd be no design on them. You got to pretend that Michael Jordan ain't on them. They would stuff the stuff full of stuff. And if it put cotton in it, they would glue it They're like this. Then he put a little generic design on it. Not Michael. You got to pretend Michael Jordan in here. Put a little generic design on it. It would be mailed to me. I'd sign for it. I'd take a hacksaw and I'd cut it right there. Start chipping at it. Take my time. Get all my stuff out of it. In a nutshell. <laughs> were they? Uh, memories. Were they those size? That size too? No. It was the the wooden eggs were probably a little bit smaller. He could get three of them in a box. They're probably like this. They were wooden Easter eggs, mm -hmm. generic wooden. And they're painted generic. That's, that's basically how they got in. People probably thought you were running some sort of antique store. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, whatever they wanted to think. Oh, well, you got any other questions? Got any other questions? It seemed like with your free time, you dabbled in like a lot of things. Like you even tried some cage fighting yourself. For oh a yeah, while. cage oh, fighting. Yeah. Well, I was the. I may not have been the worst cage fighter I ever got in a cage, but I'm damn close. <laughs> now I don't know. Actually, if I wish I had photo or a film of my amateur boxing match, I was actually pretty good in that, and I lost the decision. I don't know what made me possess think I could do that. I have no fucking idea this day. 
I'm hard headed. I was athletic. At 37 years old, I thought I'd get in a cage. And I really I should have been two and two. I had this kid beat, I had him in an ankle lock, and I fucked up. But it's not something I look back every day in my life and say, oh, I wish I'd have pursued that. Not at all. With my foot speed, I wish it maybe I would have tried football in college or baseball because I could run like a deer. But this ultimate fighting, I like it outside the cage more than I do inside the cage. Screw that. You were just too brave. Huh? You were just too brave. No, nah, yeah. Had early, <laughs> early midlife crisis. I don't know what it was. <laughs> All right. You sent a video last night of you dabbling in stand-up comedy. Yeah. Well, that's filthy. Wasn't that a bad? <laughs> you know what? That's, that's an old act. I did that in like 94 before I basically got into stuff. And uh, the police confiscated my old tape. And when I got off probation, I told my I always told my daughter about it. I said, you know, I used to do stand up, right? She said, yeah, yeah. I go, I'm going to go to the lefties and do it some night. She goes, I'm going. No, you're not. It's filthy. I'm going. So she actually filmed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's who filmed it, man. She yeah. thought it was funny. She's like me. She's got a warped sense of humor, man. Yeah. And, and Pete, I got comments on the internet that, that nobody laughed, but there was nobody in the crowd. And it, that's real political. 20 years ago, that was funny. It was plenty incorrect. People didn't like that. People were like shocked that I would get up there with that. And like, what the fuck is this guy doing, man? Was that your only set? That's my only set. <laughs> All right. Well, we should probably wrap this up. All right, man. What'd you think? You like it? Yeah, I'm glad. I'm gonna hope Anything, it works out for Anything, any last you. words for the crowd? No, thanks for coming. Hope uh, the viewers at home. Huh? The viewers at home. Viewers at home. Stay out of jail, you wouldn't like it. So yeah. The system sucks.